Yes, sir. Let's get that. Let's get that audio check done. I know y'all could hear that. Just want to make sure that I'm very clear to you without having to to yell. Hello, Meryl. First person I saw. Sasha, that better not be Sasha Stone listening to my channel. You can re-exit the premises. <clears throat> All right. All good. Excellent. Excellent. Got my adventure hat on today because I just don't know what to expect. We have no idea. Anytime we go on these, you know, I, I kind of know what to expect on 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 live videos when I do the advanced archaics because there's a lot of people I bounce emails, you know, with, and there's a lot of people that are pretty much up to up to my speed on the research. Don't know what to do about the new the new. A lot of new people come in and ask things that are real. They're real trying sometimes, but it's okay. This video here, we're removing all the aggravation. We're remove. We're gonna we're gonna put all that to the side because we're going to we're going to answer those advanced questions here. We're also gonna we're also gonna be very patient with the baby phoenixes, one hundred percent. So, so don't think your question. Yeah, I don't think your question is too much. Thank you, Don Hart. I got that package. I got those books. One of those books was a real gem. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, um, I mean, Jay Hart. Thank you. Uh, Delta Don. Yeah, you're a moderator. Yeah, you and. Yeah, I'm sorry. I stepped on, on their toes today. I didn't mean to. It was a total accident. I mean, I just can't. There's so many people that I've I've done podcasts with and network. I can't keep up with who's going live when. I didn't mean to go live at the same time as them boys. It was just total coincidence. <clears throat> I got a couple moderators that mod for Rise Above. They went live right now. So if you're here listening to me and you want to go listen to them as soon as the show's over, by all means do it. But I didn't know that they were going off because uh, I didn't get a notification. Let's see. All right. <clears throat> Sunday, you need to be here on Sunday because I'm telling you now, you need to, as soon as this live is over, I'm going to go ahead and set up the live for Sunday. It's two days from now. You're going to want, you're going to want to be there, guys. I went through the Matrix movie. Man, it is amazing what you see once you've been awakened. So I was so baffled as to how all I pulled out 26 video clips. I pulled out 26 clips for you guys. I'm going to show them, show them live and then break them down. I understand there's many YouTubers out there that have pretty much built their channels on the entire premise of decoding movies. I get that. But I'm also going to tell you this. Very few people today share my frames of reference. There are very few people that have come into contact with all the data that I have amassed. Therefore, what I found in the matrix is very different. How do I know? Because I spent a lot of time going through eight different YouTubers decodes of the movie, The Matrix, and they're not isolating hardly anything that I'm isolating. I, I don't care about the action scenes. I don't care about the CGI. I don't care about none of that. I care about the badass drops, the Easter eggs that are placed in there, in the dialogue, in the meaning of the individual's names who are speaking and what they say. Be there Sunday for the Matrix Decode. Even I had a massive, massive just mind explosion when I realized what happened to Agent Smith. The surface meaning isn't nothing. So what? So what? Neo be be Agent Smith. That's not even what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the reason why Agent Smith took his earplug off. Agent Smith is no different than the other, the other sen sentient programs. There was three of them that was chasing Neo and all those people. There's three of them, and all three of them had no personalities. They had no emotions. They had no care, no fear, no nothing. But something happened. They 
took over other people's avatars. But it was real clever how the directors did this when Morpheus was in that chair, chained to the chair, and the other two other two sentinels left the room, and Agent Smith took his earpiece off, and then he said something, and what he said reveals that he was no longer Agent Smith. Guys, it is so massively awesome. I can't wait Sunday to share it with you. Sunday, we're going live with the official Archaics Decode of the Matrix. That's what we're doing Sunday. All right. So this morning, <coughs> this morning I had to go take the van in to get an alignment, which is badly needed. And uh, I got some really good tires, 10 ply tires. And they even told me, even after my trip to North Carolina and back, even after three trips to San Diego today and all the time, all the space in between on the open highways, my tires still look brand new. But but I, I've been needing an alignment, and it wore the inside of one of my tires a little bit. So I had the tires rotated. I got a full alignment, got a full full fluids check. I did all these things. And while I'm waiting for them to get done with my van, lo and behold, right here, right here at home is an antique store I had no idea existed. So I walked into it, and oh my God, here's 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 something amazing. Antique store in Conroe, Texas. So I get this right here. I came home with this right here. 1898 was when this was reprinted. This is the reprinted 1898 editions of Hume's History of England. Look at this, guys. It's all six volumes. Nothing's missing. Hume's History of England was republished in 1898. But, but the copyright date, the originals are 1688. It's right here. Yeah, this history stops in the 16, 1680s. So this was a hell of a find. Hell of a find. I'm I'm glad I'm glad I ran into that. <coughs> I don't have any more room. That's why we're doing this raffle. Because you hold top shelves and I got boxes and boxes in the garage. They're all being raffled off to you guys. Uh so I can keep the most pertinent books that I'll be pulling from and doing videos on. Like I'll give you an example. Here's um, let me let me show this first before we get off into our Q and A. So, before Cadillac had the symbol that it had, this is what if you bought a Cadillac, you just got the Cadillac. You know, in 1911, you would get the Cadillac and it would have whatever symbol they had, but it wasn't the symbol we know today. But if you paid the dealership just extra money, it was it was back then. It wasn't called insurance for for the Cadillacs. It was a protection. If you if you paid for protection on your Cadillac, well, you got a Guardian medallion from Cadillac in 1911. This is an original 1911 Guardian Guardian medallion that was put on your Cadillac to show that it's protected. Same thing as insurance today. It's a beautiful medallion. Look at that. Beautiful. The protection medallion. The guy that sold it to me gave me the whole history of them. He said they're real popular. They've been taking them off old junk models. As soon as people see them in old junkyards and stuff, the uh, the medallion's worth the, worth more than the than the, the actual car. All the uh, I mean, if it's not restorable. So I got that today, so I can put it up in here somewhere. I'll figure it out later. I'll figure it out later. So. I just wanted to, I bought these. I want to show them to you and I'll just put them in my collection. You know, I collect antiques, not just old books. But what we did a hundred years ago and earlier, we're, we're not manufacturing anything like this anymore. The sterling silver, when it, 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 the company's name and, or, or whatever the, whatever the, the motto is for each piece. Look at this. It is amazing. I, I bought three of them today. Yeah, front and back. They're engraved with the dates and what company did them. They took great pride. Little sugar spoon. Took great pride in what they did. Look at this one. So, pure silver. Absolutely beautiful. Hold on. Let me get it. Let me get I got to get in the right light for you to see it better. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. Look at the top. How ornate that is. Wish my camera, when I got close, could show you better. 
Just awesome. And then this one, I had to get this one. Dedicated to the dedicated to the Iowa Indians. Got a big old chief in the in the bottom of the spoon, but at the top, yeah, I couldn't believe it. On the back side, it's got it's got the Phoenix clear. I'm gonna show you. Here's the front. Big old chief Indian. It's really engraved. Awesome. It's just the lighting. You guys can't really see what I see. These are beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Look at that. Look at that phoenix and that dude underneath it and a serpent wrap, a, a serpent wrapped around something at the top. USA Shield on the phoenix. When this spoon was manufactured, the, the phoenix was still a part of the great seal of the United States of America. In 1902, the last edit, the last reset, the United States government quietly changed it, the phoenix, the, from the great seal from the phoenix to the bald eagle. So these are really these are really interesting too. I'm gonna put them aside. So I'm at the antique store and I saw the complete rhymes from Mother Goose. Now guys, look, I know it's I know it looks silly, but but a lot of my baby phoenixes in here, you just don't know. My collection for of children's books, very educational materials from the 1700s and 1800s is one big giant box full of books just like this and we're pdf -ing. we're gonna well, john and i are pdf -ing, uh, all these for you to have for free we're not gonna sell them to you you're gonna get them for free a whole archaics for kids pdf pack for free of all these amazing nursery rhymes look these people took great pride in what they did these all rhyme like dr seuss they all come with illustrations and i've got stacks and stacks of books stacks of these books you guys are getting get them for free this year. John is almost done right now with the whole over 1,000 archaics books right here in this library. And when he's done, we have about three. We have three volunteers so far who are going to be scouring the internet looking for free PDFs for all the books that are in this library. And then for those that we can't find or those that are hidden behind paywalls, we're going to PDF them ourselves right here. This is, I might do a video on this. I might read these nursery rhymes like an eight-year-old kid and just read these to you because I'm so impressed with them right here on YouTube. Just do a whole YouTube video, spending time on nursery rhymes and showing you the pictures. If y'all like that idea, let me know in the, in the comment section because I'm, I'm sure thinking about doing it. So before we start the Q&A, we're going three hours today. So I'm getting my announcements out the way, getting the things I share with you. So, uh, as far as, I will tell you guys this, Gobekli Tepe has always bothered me. I know it's not as old as they're saying. I know Graham Hancock's full of crap. I know, I know that they're all misapplying, using this bogus procession of the equinox stuff. I have a video coming out showing you that it's all invented. It's not true. The procession of the equinox, this great zodiacal clock, 26,000 year history is all BS, contrived, made up. And this is what all these popular authors are dating these ancient sites with. Yeah, I've already showed you guys that Graham Hancock knows the truth. His own books show that he knows the truth. He's still publishing the false dates. So on this, on this Gobekli Tepe, I, I had a I had an epiphany. So what I what I what I realized. I already had all the research done and didn't even realize it was connected to that site. I, I didn't even know. So it's a mind explosion. It's going to be an entire video. But what I'm going to reveal to you about Gobekli, Go, I can't even say it. It's just one site, but it's actually 23 or 24. They're all spread out and they're all built by basically the same way. And the answer to their origin, who built them, where they came from, who lived in there, how they're dated, has been staring us in the face all along. We have been we have been so programmed to, to isolate certain Bible stories as happening right here when all the evidence and all the proof, even on the monument, shows they're right here. I'm going to blow your minds about Gobekli Tepe. It's nothing like you think. But we were told about it, and we almost all know the story. We just never associated it to those sites and why they were buried. It's all here, guys. So we're going to get into that, too. Mind explode. I've been having a lot of mind explosions lately, guys. A lot, a lot. Oh, uh, I'll be going on. Uh, 
John Nolan of Inspired reached out to me. He hasn't responded to my email, but I did respond to him and say, hey, yeah, man, I'm, I'm all for it. Let's do another chat. I've already been on his channel two or three times. You know, he's been on mine, so uh, I'm all for another chat. I like John. Um, Danny Katz. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a. Uh, this is only for Archaics TV. Can't put. Danny Katz has already been banned on almost every platform out there. Uh, uh, to the establishment, she's toxic, and I'm gonna do a. Uh, I'm gonna do a podcast with her, but it's not gonna be on YouTube. It's gonna be on her channel, <clears throat> and then later on, I'll put it on Archaics TV. You guys got a Sphinx video coming out because you got to know the truth about the Sphinx. You have to understand how you're being lied to. The Sphinx is not older than the Great Pyramids. The Sphinx wasn't built first. None of that's true. None of it's true at all. It is, they are dated from relatively the same time period, and it doesn't go back to 10,000 BC at 11,000, 12,000. That whole narrative is collapsing the more data that we assess. I'm going to show you guys actual pictures. I'm going to show you what the historical record says about the Sphinx. And I'm going to, and, and by the, by the end of that video, you're going to know that the Sphinx you're looking at in Egypt right now is not the Sphinx that was known in the ancient world. Somebody's been messing around. And that's why the head is not only, not only disproportionate in size, but it's a totally different color from the rest of the Sphinx. We're going to get to that. Our case is about smashing those paradigms. Anybody out there putting out that false BS? I'm telling you, man. I'm, I will mention them if it's relative to whatever whatever presentation I'm given. In the Sphinx, there's a bunch of people putting out BS on the Sphinx. Oh, uh, those of you those of you in Archaics TV, go ahead and get on there. As soon as this video is over, I will be uploading a video on Archaics TV. It was already recorded this morning. Oh, uh, so Archaics TV, you you already have a video coming out after this is over with. I just got to upload it. And my last announcement, uh, on my on my earlier live video, we had the email for the raffle. Please, hey, please, please, if you're if you're a member of my channel, if you're supporting my channel in membership, I'm not talking about a subscriber. If you're if you're a member of my my YouTube channel, uh, you can be in the raffle. If you subscribe to Archaics TV, then uh. You need to send us an email to because we already got over a thousand names in the raffle, and we're going to be pulling every week, and we're going to be pulling multiple winners a week. We're going to be sending a lot of these out until until we're done sending them out. You know. Uh, also, if you're one of my moderators of the Blue Ridge, you need to let, let us know. You need to let us know. You need to submit your names. Dawn already has a massive email list already, and that's what we're going to be raffling. And then when you're when when you win, <coughs> it's real simple verification. We got too many people that try to lie. We've done contests in the past and we got lied to, but well, we're good. We got a real good system now. As soon as somebody wins, we find out who they are. It's real easy to verify if you're a member, if you're a subscriber somewhere, because all you got to do is leave a comment where where we tell you to leave a comment, and we'll see it in real time, and we'll know you're you're the you're you're the one attached to that email. So simple. So, so if you are full of shit and you're just trying to get something when 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 uh. Trying to get something for nothing, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. You can try all you want. And the last, the last thing. Oh, my last announcement is uh in the description box right now. If you want, if you want a mug, the break free or die trying flammarian mug we have. I wish I had one in here right now to show you. I don't have one in here right now, but. Or the archaics decal for your for your for your trucks, your cars, your motorcycles, or laptops. Big old archaics decal, break for your die trying archaics.com. If you want one of those, uh, the mugs, the t-shirts, we got our archaics hats, we got archaics long sleeve, short sleeve, old style, new style. Uh, the old styles are more, are more popular, but um, yeah, man, we got we got all that. I just I, I hardly ever per push merchandise. I don't have a merchandise section on my channel, even though YouTube's been trying to pressure me to, to do it. It's just, if you want the merchandise, the email's in the description box. If you email that, she'll send you the whole list and how much it is and how much public, uh, shipping and handle is and all that. So I'll take care of that like that. Um, I forgot to put in the description box, yeah, we do have all three drives available. We got the huge archaic library drive, and uh, we have the combo, the super pack, survival pack combo, and we have the, uh, uh, oh, the massive images drive, yeah. 32,400 images from old books. So everything's out the way. We don't got everything out the way except for this little stack here. And then we can start our Q&A. 
We got more, we got plenty of time. We got over two and a half hours of QA. You guys got you guys got a video coming on this. I've already showed it. Babylonian influence on the Bible and popular belief. It's gonna blow your mind how much of the book of Genesis came straight out of Sumerian, Akkadian, and Babylonian texts. Word for word. Shadow of Atlantis. You got you, you say this this is an awesome, this is an awesome book. Yes, he misdated Atlantis. Doesn't mean that all his data is bad. That's right, guys. Awesome. Alexander Bergine is an awesome book, Shadow of Atlantis. It looks like a new book, but it's actually from 1920 something. It's a reprint. All these are old reprints. But these are the best books. These guys who are on site. I, I tell you guys all the time, don't listen to Zechariah Sitchin. You need to listen to Samuel Noah Kramer. Here he is right here. Samuel Noah Kramer, Sumerian mythology. You want to know about the Anunnaki? You want to know about the true histories? You want to understand how history unfolded and without all the, all that psychobabble and all that all that galactic federation crap that's been thrown into the Sitchin series, Earth Chronicles? Then you need to actually read real Sumerian translators. Not Zechariah Sitchin's crap. He mistranslated so many words to, to, to put his stuff together. This is real small print with a bunch of pictures of stelae, monuments, pillars, prisms. So good stuff. You got this video coming too. One of the rarest, one of the rarest texts from the ancient world, forgotten for over a thousand years. Oculus Lucanus at the top. Ocu Oculus Lucan uh, Lucanus right here. You got this one coming. I would be surprised if there's even a single YouTube video about this. You know you guys got this coming. I was so unimpressed. The Epic of Humanity, Billy Carson, Matt LaCroix. These guys should be embarrassed for what they put on, on Amazon. Advertising that this is going to go down in history as the greatest book ever that cites the most ancient texts on the real history of the world. Oh, my God. Get that out. Get that, get that out. Oh, my God. It's embarrassing. Doesn't even have a bibliography. You guys got this video coming. Darwin's mistake. Antediluvian discoveries prove dinosaurs and humans coexisted. Now, I'm, I'm going to amend that because I don't believe in dinosaurs. I believe in gigantic reptiles and gigantic uh, uh, amphibians and gigantic, gigantic wingless avians. That's what I believe. Called wingless birds, emus and stuff like that. That were even bigger in ancient times. More reptilian than bird. And when I say ancient times, in living memory. Remember, we have many Indian, Native American petroglyphs that show giant birds carrying people away. Yeah. So, you also have this book coming. This is The Phoenix by Manly P. Hall. This is a big book right here. Seven-pointed star right there. That's, what we, that's the instrument that was used to measure all the angles in the Great Pyramid. Here it is, guys. Manly P. Hall has got some amazing stuff in here. The Phoenix. And... For my, for my, my Maui, li for, I mean, for my, my, I can't even talk right now. For my Maori listeners, New Zealanders, South Pacific Islanders, for those in Melanesia, Micronesia, Polynesia, all throughout Oceania, you have a special, you have a special video coming your way because very, very few people have ever heard of the legends of Lankawi. We're going to get into it. Legends of Lankawi, right here. We'll be pulling from other sources as well. All right. All right, we got that out the way. Less than 30 minutes. I got all my sharing and all my announcements and all that out the way. Absolutely excellent. Well, I'm going to start with this first question here because it's relative to the book I just showed. It's also relative to, uh, there it is right there. These are really the only two books you need on this topic. So Brock Lucas asks, could you please elaborate on radiometric dating methods? Which ones are reputable and which are not? How could some people perpetuate far out datings of things when it might not comport? First of all, 
First of all, we need to take all of our faith that we've invested in our childhood all the way up today in the scientific community, and we need to throw it out the door. Just throw it out the door. And the reason is, is many of the things that have been dated by science were dated under older, older models that were accepted at the time, like dendrochronology. And when it was widely accepted until the 1950s and 60s, that many of these things could be dated. So the books of the 19 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s use those older dating models to basically date. William Libby's carbon-14 dating was one of the worst things that ever happened to the scientific community. And the reason is because they accepted it to be true. They accepted a tenet to be true that is untrue. And that is that the radioisotopic breakdown of carbon in our atmosphere has always remained stable. That is not true. It's never been true. All throughout human history, we have episodes of great volcanic activity, vapor canopies that appear and then disappear, sometimes smoke smoke and ash and plumish canopies that stay here for 20, 25 years. We've had vapor canopies that last for centuries. The radio, the, the breakdown of these carbon isotopes is not stable. It changes. It's going gonna, it's gonna to change from all different types of factors. We have the research of Paul LaViolette, uh, who he, I think he's passed away now, but he had, he had written a book I was very impressed with called Subquantum Kinetics. And before that, uh, which, which is basically, basically trying to tie in all the anomalies in science and make sense of them in a broader scope than quantum theory. It's a really, it's a really interesting book, but it's very hard to get through as well. Subquantum Kinetics by Paula Violet. But Paula Violet also had, had published uh, reports and books before that where he was explaining these anomalous gamma ray bursts. These gamma ray bursts are not, not only almost periodic, and I show how they line up almost perfectly with every appearance of the Nemesis X object. So you know, I have a chart that shows Paul of Violet's gamma ray bursts and 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 uh, the Nemesis X object, and and I believe it's an Anunnaki homeworld or in one of my other books, Return of the Fallen ones. I can't remember. I know it's on YouTube somewhere, but that research is very compelling because the gamma ray bursts. Uh, he concluded two things. One, they were they saturated Earth so much that our entire atmosphere was changed temporarily. Those gamma ray bursts would have completely changed the breakdown of all isotopes of everything. In addition to that, he concluded that all the evidence showed that whatever this what, what was causing it, it was coming from within our own system. It wasn't coming from the galactic core. It wasn't coming from the Cygnus, the Cygnus rift. It wasn't coming from any, uh, any other external source. It was coming from right here. He said it was highly local. So what I, the reason I'm mentioning all this is, is because many, many scientists and, and, and researchers have already concluded that these are absolutely imperfect systems of measurement. Are absolutely imperfect uh, systems of measurement. But <clears throat> this is why scientists now call them relative dating methods. You can look that term up. This is what they're called. They're generalizing them all now. Potassium argon, uh, carbon-14, Oh, oh, I forgot, uranium, nickel, dating, whatever. There's so many different kinds, and they all rely on the same thing. Every single one of them rely on the lie that the breakdown of isotopes has always been stable. It's never been stable. It's never been stable. We have, this is the, the problem is, is that science comes from the uniformitarian perspective, which is nothing really changes. Everything is so gradual, it takes millions and millions of years. That's uniformitarianism. However, the history of the world that we find, what we visually see, what we dig up with a spade and an ax, what we read in the historical record, what we find in legends and traditions is not uniformitarianism. It is 100% catastrophism. And the catastrophist model of science was the one that was predominant for hundreds of years before the big rich billionaires got in the game and started funding only the scientists that were promoting uniformitarianism. And the catastrophists lost out, even though catastrophists, even as far as the 1890s, were still producing material that completely overturned all the uniformitarian model. They were just ignored. They were defunded. They were essentially academically silenced. These two books here will educate you on the particulars of what I just told you. These two books here go into great depth 
on how manipulative carbon-14 dating is, on uh, potassium argon, ice core drilling. Yeah, especially the ice core drilling. That is the most manipulative of all dating methods because now we know these vapor canopies, they take those ice caps away quick, quick. Let me tell you, what, let me tell you uh, any researcher who relies on ice core dating, do you know what they're never going to cite in their bibliographies? Do you know what they're never going to say? They're never going to, to draw attention to the works of Charles Hapgood in 1950, professor who published Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings. Do you know why anybody who relies on ice core dating would want to completely ignore Charles Hapgood's findings, which were which were actually read by Albert Einstein. The reason why is because the ice core datings are perpetuating that it's a record of history going back 10, 11, 12,000 years. And yet we have 14th and 15th and 16th century maps that show Antarctica completely free of ice. The mountains and rivers are exactly where we see them in subsurface interface radar. When we when we do the subsurface interface radar below the ice, that is exactly what an article looks like, what these maps purport. Both cannot be true. Either somebody is lying about how long it takes for those ice caps to build, or somebody has time traveled and brought maps from 10,000 years ago and planted on planted them on Turkish navigators 600 years ago. Well, employing Occam's razor, I'm going to have to go with the first, which is ice caps can form extremely fast. And it's not just a theory to me. I've already, I've already basically shown the model. The model is very easy. Great floods have happened four times in recorded history. Two of those times were collapses of vapor canopies. When a vapor canopy collapses, the requisite moisture to create these two mile high ice caps is present. It's called rain. It comes down. The vapor canopy collapses. All that, the whole mesosphere of water droplets just falls. In the equatorial and temperate areas, it falls as rain. It floods that out. It washes away cities. People are on arcs. The whole civilizations have, have put all their valuables on, on arcs and ships and, and dinghies and everybody else is in the, is in the ca caves and mountain mountaintops. However, toward the extremities, the further away from the equator, the cooler the temperature gets. So in those areas, in either model, the globe model or the flat earth model, it doesn't matter. For the further away south of the equator, it's going to get colder and colder and colder in both models. And it just so happens that we call that Antarctica. And Antarctica has two miles high of ice and snow. However, it's impossible for that two miles to have been created by the present climate. This totally defies uniformitarian theory. The uniformitarian theory is that everything happens over long periods of time. However, there's no way that two-mile-high ice cap could be there under that model because Antarctica has no humidity. Even today, it gets less than half an inch of snow a year. So this is why we have 60 different ice age theories. Because nobody can agree. And as soon as scientists get together and think they've wrapped their mind around it and come up with a new way that two mile high ice could be there, paleobotanists step in and say, well, because of this right here, that's not true. In other, in other areas, geologists come forward. So far, ice age is still a theory, although they promote it as a fact because of relative dating, dating methods. You want to know about how deceitful and how, how arbitrary these dating methods are, I, I, I suggest you read these books. If you read this book, it's, it's going to be, it's going to change your life. Evolution, evolution, this is called the Evolution Handbook now, but it's originally called Evolution Cruncher. It's the same book. This is just the updated version. I've, I've heavily promoted this book on my channel, but he goes into it, he goes into it quite a bit as well. So does William Cooper. A lot of people don't know about the book. William Cooper wrote a book called, called After the Flood. In that book, After the Flood, it is amazing all the data he puts together from all over the world to show exactly the scenario that I'm telling you about. 
these relative dating, dating, dating systems and methods are absolutely untrue. William Livy didn't even have a lot of faith in his own system, just like Charles Darwin didn't have a lot of faith in his own system. And Charles Darwin even, even it was quoted in his own book on the origin of species of making several catastrophe statements. Yeah, it has nothing to do with the individual researchers and individual men. It has everything to do with the control system that wants to educate, educate us into a false paradigm. That's the one that gets funded. These are all BS. All, all, all the all the all, all the dendrochronology dendrochronology was responsible for getting a lot of books published because now they had a set date and they could date different volcanoes they could date different earthquakes by these by these dendrochronological analysis and counting tree rings then all of a sudden in the 1970s two researchers pop up and say hey all that's untrue everything we've published up until this point and dated in all of our history books can't be right because trees grow two rings they have two wet seasons a year. Did they rewrite the history books? Did they redate anything? Did they retract anything? Absolutely not. Science never goes backward to correct former mistakes. They let the lie continue as they just build on to it. That's why the entire scientific paradigm is a house of cards. It's all BS. It's all BS. I don't need, I, I'm, I'm reading from the- uh, I got them all off there for you. Okay, thank They're you. in order. Cool. All right. That'll work then. She's the boss. Let's see. Mm. Well, hell, I, I actually asked the first one that's on the list. Could you please elaborate on radio metric, radio metric dating methods? Those two books, especially, if you don't read anything, Brock Lucas, Evolution Cruncher, will give you all the scientific data you will ever need to know that all these systems are BS all BS. You already know how, how geology dates rocks. They date, they date rocks by index fossils. Index fossils? Well, how are index fossils dated? Oh, the index fossils are dated by the rocks they're found in. 100%. I'm not making that up. Circular reasoning. Jason, can you make a video with Sheep Farm Podcast? They are friends of Rise Above. I've never heard of them. I don't know if I can or not. I gotta look into them. I don't know. Never even heard of them. You didn't even tell me what they're about. Okay. See, this 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 right here doesn't let me know who asked the question. Hey, Don, if you're listening to listening to me, uh, this right here doesn't let me know who asked it. I like to call them out by name. Let's see. I'm gonna keep. I'm just gonna keep looking at the list. See. All right, girl sees dragons. Question, Jason, I see dragons and huge creatures in the sky like you described before the flood. Am I seeing another dimension or beyond the vapor canopy? I don't know what you're seeing. I'm not you. Just don't know. Uh, I do know that Trevor James Constable has published two fascinating books showing the showing the 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 living the living amoeba like organisms that can change shapes that are in our skies. And he photographed them using a special lens in, in uh, like purple, violet, uh, I don't know. It's ultraviolet spectrum. We can't see it with the neck, naked of eye, but he's taking, and he's got some, he's got some guy my publisher told me about. He's gone. He's died. He's passed away. But there's somebody who has taken up his work and has even better pictures. I'm, I need to get in contact with him. But uh, I don't know what you see. I don't know what you see. I don't, I don't know what filters you're using. I don't know what kind of lens you're using. Uh, if you're talking about you see these things with the naked eye, uh, I don't know. I just know that that's what that's what entheogens do. That's what that's what uh, different drugs that alter the mind. They strip away the filters so you can see what's actually there. The filters actually protect us. You know, we complain that we only see 5.5 percent of the electromagnetic spectrum, but that's actually a protection to us because if you could see the other 94.5 percent, you would never be able to get anything done. Everything would be in the way all the time. So. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> so I, I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, I, I it's, you got to understand, I, I, I don't denigrate other people's research and all that, but I have very, 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 very rarely ever taken an image as evidence of anything because they can be, they can be manipulated. Like my last video shows, all that whole video strip with AI art, 
They looked like real people, real sailboats, real ocean, real insects, real statues. It was all AI generated art in that video I showed. So you know, we've gotten to the point where 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 deep fake technology can just show us the news. That's all you're looking at. When you watch the news and you watch Biden, you are watching deep fake technology. You're not right. You're not watching real people. It's crazy. From what I hear, Washington, D.C. is still a ghost town. There's still people reporting about Washington, D.C. still being empty, a ghost town, all the government buildings. <sighs> kind of tells me the United States is a captured operation. But I don't know. You'd have to ask Juan O'Savin about that. He seems to know everything. Only all caps, guys. I need to just go with this. I can't. All right. <clears throat> Jason, do you know the year the next vapor canopy will return? I am really convinced that the vapor canopy will, will be coming back in 2039 to 2040 at some time. Yeah, even before the Phoenix phenomenon, all it takes is volcanic activity. The only, the only, the only requirement whatsoever for a vapor canopy to completely enshroud our skies is volcanism. That's it. That's why Phoenix is always associated to the burning mountain, the holy mountain with fire on it. It's, it's what it is. When ash and pumice are shoved up into the atmosphere, I mean, think about 1883, Krakatoa, one single volcano cooled the entire world's temperatures and sent a dust veil over, over a huge portion of the earth for a very long time. I believe that's the one that created the uh, three-year winter. So listen, Imagine, imagine just a dozen major volcanoes on land spewing ash and pumice into the atmosphere for a good 30-day period. At the same time that another dozen volcanoes under the oceans boil. That's nothing but pure steam coming up. Vapor canopy will be fast. Once all, once all of that gets, gets trapped in the mesosphere, it just spins there. It hangs there for a long period of time. Then it blocks the sun out and all that. So, yeah, vapor, can vapor canopies come and go, guys. We have them described in the historical record. 2030, the sixth seal of the apocalypse is a return of a vapor canopy. The seven trumpets and everything that unfolds in, like, second Esdras, that's another thing. I've already marked it. I didn't even tell y'all tell you guys that. This, this old Bible here from the 1800s, no really good condition, but this is an old Bible that has the Apocrypha. It's got Bell and the Dragon, the Book of Tobit. It's got the Book of Adam and Eve. It's got uh, the books of First and Second Esdras, the Book of Enoch. Every the whole all the apocryphal and pseudo-biographical books are in here. So I have already marked. Here it is, the Apocrypha. Uh, first and Second Esdras. I'll be doing a video out of that. We'll be doing a little Bible study video out of. Because the prophecies that are found in Ezra's are awesome. Now, that's not Ezra. There's a book called Ezra in the Old Testament. This is Esdras, which is the Greek Ezra. And they're totally different books. Yeah, we'll be getting into that. Like I said, guys, we started in 2024 with a bang. By, 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 the time, by the time the Olympics kick off, in 2024, you'll be able to look back and say, oh my God, I can't believe how much I learned on Archaic since January. Yeah, that's how much I'm releasing in January, February, and March. Oh, and, uh, and April and June. Olympics don't kick off till like late June, July. Was the dark satellite created by the simulacrum or created by beings in the holography? I would never be able to answer that. I don't know. I would not I would not be able to answer that. I just don't know. I do know, I do know that starting with starting with 1899 BC, we have an unbroken chronology from 1899 BC, which is 
which is 1996 Annis Mundi. It is the year of the Tower of Babel incident when there was a confusion of languages. I've done a video about it showing that, look, this could have only happened in a simulation. There is no way that an entire group of people speaking one language was coming together to build a structure to try to break out of this world. Come on. This is what the Tower of Babel story is about. When you, when you remove all the dressing, the lowest common denominators was the overseers looked down and saw that a architectural project was going on. And even the overseers said humans have gotten way too intelligent and too imaginative to the point where there's nothing they cannot accomplish. So in order to keep them from being able to break out of this reality, the sim, because that's what they were trying to do by build, building this architect. It's, and later on, it became the Tower of Babel. But originally, it was an architectural structure that was designed to breach the simulation. They were going to do it. So, whoever the overseers are, they sent a cataclysm. But they sent it as an object that created a massive amount of destruction. And it was an object that could focus huge plasma, which we call flux tubes. Huge bolts, billions of billions of uh, whatever. I, I'm not an electrician. I don't know. Like, but I'm going to tell you now. In the historical record, they call them thunderbolts in lightning, and they just vaporized and melted cities and fortresses. And it wasn't just at that site; it was their whole civilization was reset. And then all of a sudden, when they tried to come back together, they could only understand certain people. And after the end of two or three months, everybody was divided into seventy different groups. They all spoke seventy different languages. Only in a simulation is that possible. Only in, in a hollow field can you take a single language and turn it into 70 different languages. It is a change. It is an alteration in programming. That's what it is. Thank you. It's an alteration in programming. That's exactly what it is. That's what the story is conveying to us. The dark satellite appears. But according to the mystic traditions, the dark satellite is a prison that contains ancient ones. And I've shown this. Fragments of that are in the old Arabic mystic traditions. We see fragments of it in the Necronomicon. Remember, the Necronomicon was genius because we already know it was fiction. That's why they got away with telling the truth in it about the gate of Yakshakak and about the portal that they're trying to open. It's all in there from over 100 years ago. This is why I show on my channel in Dark Scriptures Playlist, I have videos showing you that some of the satanic literature told the truth and knew it could hide the truth for generation after generation by labeling it as satanic literature because people would ignore it until, until the time that it was actually understood for what it was. Yeah, some, of you need, some of you guys need to look at my, my Dark Scriptures, uh, like, like uh, Daughters of Pale Lilith Stand, that video there. Yeah, that's some, it's got some amazing stuff about the Great Pyramid and what it truly is. So, Dark Satellite has a perfect periodicity. It's perfect all the way to a year, 713 B.C., when something else weird happened. What happened in that year? All of a sudden, the year changed from 360 days a year to 365. And again, another thunderbolt from, from heaven. In the book, in the book of uh, Isaiah, we find that... Uh, in the days of King Hezekiah, a thunderbolt came from the sky and, and, and vaporized 185,000 Assyrian soldiers that were going to attack Jerusalem. That's amazing. It's, a, it's exactly on this on this periodicity of the dark satellite. And if anybody wants to know, that's in my in my book, uh, uh, Anunnaki Homeworld. I give the exact chronology of the dark satellite when it's been seen. I have even more data for that now. I even have a video on, on the dark satellite. But that same periodicity never changed. And it counts all the way to 2052 coming up. What's going to happen in 2052? Well, every time the dark satellite appeared in history, it caused edits. It changed little things in reality, and it also just exploded with, with flux tube activity. Something in the sky interacting with our field was just blasting cities and fortresses and melting them. It vitrified. This is the origin of the vitrified monuments, the monuments that have been hit with such intense heat that they crystallize. So they melt like glass. 
So that's that's what the dark satellite does. It'll be back in 2052. Was it created by the simulacrum? I don't know. Simulacrum, however you want to say it. Was it created by beings in the holography? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I know that in the traditions, it was called Kingu. And this is the old Akkadian traditions, the cuneiform. It was called Kingu. And it was a former like rock and metal moon of a much larger body. So uh, I don't know. I just don't know. But in the mystic traditions, it's a prison. Charles Burgoyne in the 1880s, in his ancient Egypt, Light of the World, he goes off and he explains. He's got a lot, of, a lot of material about it. Talks about the ancient ones imprisoned in this object and how they're coming back for the last days. It's all in there. Charles Burgoyne. You just have to listen to my dark satellite video on that. Let's see. Jason, what's your take on the crystal skulls? All right. One crystal skull was found, Central America, uh, at an ancient ruined site called Lubantan. Uh, by all, by all, here's where the controversy lies. There's no controversy that a crystal skull was found. All right. But three or four more crystal skulls have been found since then, and that's where the controversy lies. It seems as if there's an agency out there making replicas and false ones and throwing them out there to mud muddy the waters. And the reason I'm saying that is because the original crystal skull cannot actually exist. I'm telling you with, with my mouth that it was found and it was discovered at, in the ancient pre-Mayan ruins of Lubantan. Very ancient, way before the Maya very ancient city these ruins this crystal skull was found i'm telling you it was found i'm telling you it was the truth i'm also telling you as a crystal skull it is impossible it cannot exist it has a movable jaw just like the human jaw the everything is anatomically perfect on the crystal skull even even all the fractures of the cranium that's what i'm telling you guys as a piece of art it is impossible the crystal skull looks just like a human cranium with the jawbone still intact because the crystal skull still has the movable jawbone. But how do you do that with crystal? You can't, it has no yield. You can't, you can't, you can't fit the jaw in. It's impossible. Crystal will not bend. There's no way to put the jaw in there. There's no way to carve it in there. So I have a theory. I have a theory that somehow technological, some maybe technology or or something, some poor bastard got vaporized and turned into crystal, because that's the only explanation for the for the crystal skull of Lubantin. But uh, the other skulls that were found after that are totally to muddy, muddy the water. They're to, they're totally to make you think that the whole original skull was bullshit. All right. <clears throat> Any info on the guy who took possession of almost all the Florida lands in a Phoenix year of 1764? I don't know. 1764 has a lot of interesting Phoenix-related material. Uh, I just don't know because at that at that at that point in time, I mean, we don't have a lot of information for uh, on Florida at that time. You, you, this is a uh, 1764. I would like to know anything that you know, because apparently you're asking from a position of awareness. You're aware of something I'm not. I'm not. But I know 1764 was on the 138 year Phoenix periodicity. I'm just not sure who you're talking about. This guy who took possession of almost all the lands in Florida in that year. I would not be surprised at all. Wouldn't even be surprised. I would like to have more data on that. see some of these are real general questions what i mean is is a general question almost almost always results in a general answer so if you want something highly specific you're looking for it needs to be a very specific question oh uh, like this one how about the antichrist speculation and end times tia tia or is it tia I don't. I don't know. Um, the Judeo-Christian version of the of the apocalypse and how to interpret the Book of Revelation, as I've shown in my prior presentations, is bullshit. We were 
we were led to believe that we had to interpret the book of Revelation as uh, as it would be interpreted if it was a Judeo-Christian document, but that's not what we found. By using the Judeo-Christian interpretation, we completely missed the Phoenix phenomenon being the sixth seal, like it was many times in history. We completely missed the fact that, that the white horseman holding a bow and given a crown is emblematic of a major, major figure in mythology that has nothing to do with, with the, uh, the Judeo-Christian version of the white horseman being a messa messianic figure, like an antichrist. Um, um, it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with Apollo Pharmakia. And uh, I've already gone, gone into great detail in prior videos how the first seal, basically in Greek, describes the servants of Apollo attacking the human family with something that was poisonous. This was a, this is the interpretation. This is using just the Greek to interpret the first seal. Therefore, the second seal is going to be very different than what the Judeo-Christian version uh, tells us as well. So as far as Antichrist goes, we're not there yet. I don't even, I don't believe we're there at all. The seals need to be broken before the beast kingdom can even be unleashed. The seals need to be broken before Apollo can even be released from, from, from the pit. So this is all in Revelation. Remember the book, the theme of the book of Revelation is the release of Apollyon. Yeah, that's what it's about. The seals just begin that process. So I don't see an Antichrist appearing unless it's a false apocalypse and false Antichrist. We're not there yet. We're about to we're about to see this year the unfolding of the second seal of the apocalypse. And it's going to be a ride. It's going to be a ride, man. A lot of people are going to have those aha moments. They're going to be going, "Wow!" And a whole bunch of people who are riding the fence are going to are going to are going to see this unfold exactly the way as I described in my videos, interpreting the second seal, and they're going to look back on the first seal now and say, "Damn, that was dead on accurate." Yeah, the seals were designed to wake us up. We have nothing to fear. So, what technology was used to make the simulacrum and AIX? Where did those technologies come from? I don't, I don't even know why you would even think I would know that. I would know that. My research is based. My research is based off the amalgamation of a tremendous amount of data. Data that most people have never been able to put put together because they have lives, they have children, they have raised, they have work, occupation. They go on, they go on trips. I sat in a prison cell and I cogitated on all these things, and I brought every piece of acceptable data that I actually accepted to be true into my paradigm to put it all together, and I came up with the conclusion that we live in a construct. I used to think it was a construct, one hundred percent, you know, built by God. It's all, and it probably was, but AIX is not godly at all. It is an agitator. And it could be, it could be, it could be an agitator program. It could actually be what I, what I've inferred many times. AIX, artificial intelligence X. X means it's an unknown factor. Hence, hence my platform is called RKX, Advanced Research of Chronological History of Artificial Intelligence X. Where do I get the chronological history from? My baby phoenixes might not know this, but I have over 200 videos that go deep into world chronology showing you fascinating mathematical patterns that cannot be true, and yet they are. They're all very well documented. This is why I know we live in a construct. If if the present is a part and an, and an extension of a greater construct, then that means all of history was constructed as well. If I can show that anything is true today, then it was true yesterday as well. So this is where I get this. Can I can, can I tell you what kind of technology? I don't know. I believe that we're we're suspended within right now a very hyperdimensional spiritual technology, but we can't recognize it. No one inside a bubble can see objectively outside the sphere of that bubble because you're looking through a thin film. And although you think you see clearly, that film is going gonna, is gonna to create some distortion. But you're not going to know that from inside. You're subjected to the distortion. On the outside of the bubble, you can see very clear. And you can see that the, the soul that's on the inside of the bubble is very unclear. You're looking from a totally different perspective. I believe it's all spiritual, but I, uh, I, I don't believe that there is any contradiction whatsoever in the term spiritual technology.
What's your thoughts on a thousand years of peace mentioned in the Bible? There are a lot of statements like that, that uh, could, they could be interpolations. I don't really give that statement a whole lot of credence. Um, I don't, because remember, it's, there's, there's, many, there's many times where it says in the days of Noah. Okay, well, day, it's talking about a period of time, but it also says a day unto the Lord is as a thousand years. So unless it's giving me something highly specific, like seven days, or, or like in the book of Daniel, in 2,300 days, then I can't really, that right there is a general term for a long period of time. Please clarify the line year between B.C. and A.D. I get confused. Well, I'll tell you what, let's just screen share. I'll tell you what. I'm going to Chronicon. This this for everybody to see. I'm going to my, my my I'm going to my desktop version of Chronicon, which any of you can order. It's amazing. Let me show you. Let, let me show you real quick. Anybody can order this. This is a lifetime's worth of research. Edited. Shiva Shampoo was in on it. Bay Bet was in on it. Don Kosh was in on it. They they edited it. They checked my math. They checked my numbers. Thank you. They checked all these things. I'm going to show you how easy it is to use this because we just started we just started selling these on Podia. But this is a massive amount of research. It is the history of the world in chronological order showing you things I promise you have never seen before. Showing you mathematical patterns and it's amazing. I mean, there could be a hundred YouTube channels putting out a video a week based off the research in Chronicon, and still it would take years to get all this out. As as Shiva Shampoo, he's he, this that man knows. He spent a lot of time with the calculator checking my math. So let me share my screen and show you. I'm going to show you exactly how we know the BC where BC and AD flow together. How we know the time. I'm showing you right now. Because I because I, I provide that in Chronicon. It's very easy to see why I stick to the Annus Mundi calendar. It's an unbroken year timeline going thousands of years. And the BC AD overlap is very, very uh confusing to people. They always get one or one year too many or one year too less in their calculations. It's because they're not paying attention to this one little fact. I'm gonna I'm about to show it. Let me share my screen. All right, present, share screen. I'm going to share my entire screen. Go here. All right, so here it is right here, guys. This is Chronicon. Oh, it's massive. So we're just going to go down here. This is the legend that tells you all the other stuff. We're going to go down here. This little PayPal deal is not for me. This is it. Though for those who order order Chronicon, you can donate because she deserves it. Baybet was the main editor. She went through the over five hundred hours of of typing. Here it is, over half a million words. Okay, you can see it all right here. There it is. So here is <coughs> Chronicon. I'm going to show you how this works. Here's the forward, tells you a bunch of details. Intro about about ma these are magic numbers. These are magic numbers. I don't care if you I don't care what you're doing. Pre in, in, in predictive systems of analysis, if you're trying to separate fact from fiction, whatever you're trying to do, these are the magic numbers. And then here's how Chronicon begins. This massive document. Let me show you. Here's before the flood. The, the archive one is 3,000 years covered in 98 day, dates. Now look at this. We'll go to, let me, let me pick 3895 BC. You see this? 3895 BC. All I have to do is click onto this arrow. 3895 BC right here shows me it's 6,000 years. Oh, there's a typo here. Damn. That's not before flood. That's before Armageddon. 1656 years before flood. It's 1,344 years after the Nemesis Cataclysm. It's 414 years of the Phoenix Calendar. It's the 144th year since the capture of Luna, the capture flood, when the moon appeared. When I hit this arrow on the side, it opens up that entire 
Hold on. It opens up the entire deal. Man, I don't know what's going on with my computer right now. Maybe it's because I'm sharing the screen. Yeah. Might be because I'm sharing the screen, guys. It's not letting me open that document. Yeah, I've never seen that before. Yeah, something happened. Or maybe because, I, because I'm on StreamYard and this document is so big, it's not responding. Hit index. What are you talking about? It says index at the very end of each one, and that's the link. You don't see no, index. My computer's not responding. It's, uh, my computer just went off. Yeah, uh, not the arrow. It says index. Wow. Okay, Microsoft Word is not responding. That's what happened. I'm going to restart that program. Yeah, guys, Chronicon's huge. There we go. There we go. I'm going to exit it. I'm going to exit that. I don't know what's going on with this. This is Wow. That's frustrating. I just want I just want out now. Damn, I just want out. Just let me out of there. Oh my god. Is it not going to let me out? Collapsed by default. I'm running too many operations on my deal at the same time. That's crazy. I don't like that. That's the first time that ever happened to me. It was in a live video. How embarrassing is that? That's crazy. There it is. I'm going to do it again. I'm going right back to where I was. There are thousands of these entries. There it is. See, it worked just fine. Second time, it worked just fine. I clicked onto the arrow next to it. It opens up that whole date. Look, this is all 3895 BC. This is the year Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden. Here it is right here. This is the beginning of the 1,656 years before the flood. This is just one date. Look how much data is here. This is where the word, the origin of the word Adam. Here's the here's the gematria. Everything that's said in the Kabbalah, in the Midrashic text, the ancient Greek. Look at that. Here it is right here. <clears throat> it's a lot of data. Here, the red part is 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 new research notes that were added in. The blue part is new research notes from a different time period that were added in. I, I never stop researching, guys. Over and over. This is all one date. It's all one date. This is all 3895 BC right here. It's massive. This is the beginning. At the end, here it is right here. All this is the bibliography. This is where I got all of that data right here. That's how that's how uh, Chronicon is. So let's go to what you asked for. You asked for the confluence between a, a BC and AD. So let's go there. I'm going to show you right now. Here it is. 1 BC, there's 3 BC, 2 BC, 1 BC, and then we get to 1 CE. I'm going to click on 1 CE and show you what, show you how it works. All right, so uh, maybe it's in the Jesus section. Hold on. I got a chart. There's a chart drawn. That, that, oh, here it is right here. Anno Domini calendar. There's your chart right there. This shows you how it works. 4 BC, 3 BC, 2 BC, 1 BC, then it's 1 AD. Many people make the mistake of putting a zero in between them. There's no year zero. There's no year zero BC. There's no year zero uh, uh, AD. These butt up to each other. And here are the Annus Mundi dates. They, the Annus Mundi dates are absolutely perfect. 3891, 3892, 3893. There it is right there. Blow it up for you guys. That's out of Chronicon. That's how the BC calendar merges with the AD calendar. And this is what the year is on the, on the Annus Mundi. The Annus Mundi is unbroken. 3893, 3894, 3895, 3896, 3897. There's the BC. There's the AD. I hope that answered your question. But it goes into a lot. Chronicon, you can spend, you can spend, a, long, you can spend a long time reading Chronicon. 
It's amazing, guys. I'm going to get out of here. In this version of Chronicon, we even go into the future. I'll go look. I'm going to show you. Look, every single year is here. 1948, 49, 50, 51, 52. Most people don't even know their history. You know, most people don't even know all these events unfolded on the on these dates. Amazing events that are recorded on these dates. Here's my birth year, 1973. Yeah, man, it's all here, guys. Look at this. Oh, look at that. 20, 2018, 2020, 2021. Look at this. 2028, 2036, 2037, 2030. 8, 30, 20, 39, 20, 40. You can click on to any one of these dates and it's going to open up a huge section of the future. Nostradamus prophecies, Mother Shipton, uh, what we find in the Old Testament prophecies, the apocryphal prophecies, the pseudo-epigraphical prophecies, the Greek Sibylline oracle prophecies, what we find in the New Testament prophecies. Everything is in here, all indexed and in chronological order. It's the future. It's the future all in Chronicon right here going through. It's massive, guys. I got to do videos on all these dates. You talked about the dark satellite. Here it is, 2052. Click on that. Oh, look at all that. Look at all that. Everything from the historical record showing the dark satellites coming on this date. What ancient texts talk about it. It's all here, guys. It's all here. Return of the Chief Cornerstone. Oh, there's 2070. There's 2070, guys. This is when everybody who's exiting exiting the construct, this is the year that they will be sealed. This is the year of the enig enigmatic statement in Revelation. He that be evil, let him be evil still. Because it's too late to change. You're stuck here. All the good After this date, all the good in the world is not going to help you if you're not ready. Anyway, I, I need to get out of this document. It's too much on a computer, apparently. But that, that is Chronicon. If you want to order Chronicon, go to Podia. Go to my website. Look at the Podia links. It'll take you straight to Chronicon. Or, or if you want to order Chronicon, just hit the e, just hit the uh, the email that I provided in the description box right here, and Don will send you a link to to order to order uh, Chronicon. Chronicon is, is the only book you'll you'll ever need to read. I'm telling you that now. All right, I need to quit sharing my screen because there we go. Sorry, guys, I took too long on that question. Yeah, I, guys, I hardly ever plug my own my own materials and all that. It's it's almost unbelievable the amount of research. I didn't have anything to do. People go on vacations. They raise their kids. They go to college. They go to specialty schools. They 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 work forty. You know, they work uh, years and years at an occupation. They come home and they watch Married with Children and all that. I didn't have, I didn't get to do all that. I sat in a prison cell and I read books and I read more books and I became fascinated with everything I was reading and I borrowed and I traded books. I had people all over the world sending me books when they realized what I was doing. And I was sending letters to all these places and I, people were just. And it's just crazy. And then my dad every month was was visiting me and bringing me books and and ordering me books. And then I met I met Paul Tice of the Book Tree and and uh, way before I got my publishing contract, they were sending me books from their catalog. They didn't know who I was. I was devouring everything in their catalog. Ordering I was ordering packages every single month for years. I was devouring it. And then other inmates were also other inmates in prison were also on on some research stuff. And they were trying to learn things. So there was always I could always take a stack of books I was done with. I had already data mined them. My dad had already picked up huge chain sacks full of all my written handwritten notes. Then I got a typewriter, an old typewriter. and I started typing all my notes and organizing them in chronological order. It just naturally unfolded. The more I, I recorded my notes chronologically, the more everything started to make sense. And I discovered the 138-year Phoenix phenomenon. Then I discovered the 792-year Nemesis X period. Then I discovered the 394.5 dark satellite periodicity. When, and when I discovered all that and overlaid them over the history of the world, it all made sense. Every bit of it made sense. It allowed me to date the sixth seal of the apocalypse as the Phoenix phenomenon, 138 years after 1902. It's all there, guys. Chronicon, if my YouTube channel and my other published books doesn't make you a believer, I promise Chronicon will. You can't read Chronicon. It, you just can't read Chronicon as a critic. The more you read it and you see all these amazing mathematical patterns all throughout history, there's no way to deny it. You're in the damn matrix. You're in a matrix. It's as simple as that. <clears throat> you 
Owannies, uh, Barfling Arcane. Can you get into Owannies and his history? There's not much there because Owannies is nothing but a Semiticized Babylonian version of the Sumerian Ea. And Ea is Enoch. And we know in 3439 BC, Enoch appeared with 50 Anuna, later called Anunnaki in Babylon. And he appeared in 3439 in the Gihon Flood. And I've got whole videos and published books about this single incident. But when you quote Oannes, the half dagon fish god of Babylon, you're actually referring to Ea, who was Enoch. So it's a, a you're referring to the Babylonian version of an actual historical person who was among the Anuna, humans, not gods. The uh, among the Anuna who uh, was about a thousand years before. The Babylonians even created the version of Oannes. Let's see. Sorry if I went on that tangent, guys, on Chronicon. I'm trying to catch up on my chat. Yeah, when, you, when you're messing with Chronicon, guys, you can't have anything else open. It's a, that's how big the document is. You click on anything, it just unfolds everything that I've recorded for that year. Like I said, it's got all the source materials. It's got it's Chronicon is my magnum opus. So, oh, how long can people live without the sun? I, I think they can live if they if they can supplement vitamin D. If they can find an acceptable source of vitamin D, I don't see why they can't live normally underground. I mean, we have peptides. Peptides are the building blocks. They synthesize anything the human needs. Anything the human body is not getting a lot of, peptides can synthesize those things for for the body. Now, I don't know. I don't really know. Uh, how to answer this. I don't want to act like I know everything. It's it's how long can people live without the sun? Well, I'm going to have to say quite a, quite a while. We have 60 underground cities in Turkey. That's not Jason telling you this. Anybody can Google it. You, I, Dogen Zoyabit, how you, I don't even know how you say it, but there are so many. As a matter of fact, I'm bringing two special guests, a married couple, two special guests, Chris and Steve Kremi will be coming on my channel and we're going to be talking about their travels in Turkey. And I'm going to be revealing to you guys some things that I have found out because there is no other country in the world like Turkey when it comes to the richness and diversity of massive amounts of archaeological sites and findings. Yeah, I'm going to educate you guys. Everything has been found in Turkey. Everything. And there's no country in the world that can boast to such a rich archaeology as Turkey. It's, it's amazing. It's where the Go, Gobleki Tepe and all the other Tepe sites are. It's where Ararat is, where Noah's Ark was supposedly, whatever that structure is. Jason of Archaics is telling you they found a legitimate structure. Do I think it was Noah's Ark? I don't know. Could it have been one of many arcs that were trying to survive that cataclysm? Absolutely. So we're going to get to that. Are extraterrestrial controller beings an Agent Smith character of AIX? I don't believe in extraterrestrials. I see absolutely zero evidence. I believe Eric, Eric Von Daniken is completely wrong, and every single book could be rewritten by me, removing all 27 of, of Eric Von Daniken's books could be written by me and, and, and be just as good showing that humans are responsible for all the technological advancements that we find in the archaeological record. Everything from technolithic engineering, hyperbolic curves, everything about the hypersonic fracture quarrying, all the evidence from the ancient world. Humans. Remember, it only takes us 200 years to go from horse and buggy to hadron collider. We don't need no damn ET to come down here and teach us to do anything. We've been doing it. And, we, and human inno innovation is so complex that it only takes a short period of time. And we're already inventing a whole new infrastructure. We don't need aliens. Never needed an ETs. I don't buy into any Galactic Federation ancient alien crap. It's all adult fantasy, and anybody who falls for that paradigm should be ashamed of themselves. Thank you. It's Scooby-Doo for adults. On average, Joe. 
I have the names now with everybody. On average, Joe. Off topic. See, I'm done with this. Wait a minute. Okay, I got that one done. Okay, cool. I finished those. Now I got all your names now. Good. Thank you. On average, Joe. Off topic. But is it possible that there could be a technology that is being used to make lifelike holograms of helicopters flying over your home, home noise and all? Absolutely. Absolutely. If it can be shown that any one thing is just coding, is just programming, then anything can be coding and programming. Absolutely. We are now we are now at, at the juncture where we have to be very discriminating of what we accept as evidence of anything. From the beginning of my channel, I have been telling at one time all my archaic veterans were baby phoenixes. And they and they they grew with me as we discovered more and we, and we revealed more. And some of them provided me some interesting data, and I had to I had to cogitate and I had to process it, and then I had to fit it into the paradigm. I released new videos with the new new information, and as we grew together, we realized that from the beginning of my channel, I have been saying something that that people are now starting to catch on to as being very important. You've got to be discriminating in what you accept to be true when it comes to the optics, because now they now they can they can distort and they can completely manufacture anything. Half of the people we see on the news aren't even real. They're not even real. There are some news stations now that are completely all 100 percent AI. There's no new real human in there. Guys, this is the world we live in. There are whole YouTube channels now that are completely done by chat gpt4 open ai systems are now creating their own people are using open ai to create content and channels and you can see too it's not very dynamic it's just but this is the beginning now all social media like facebook and tiktok and everybody's showing all these pictures of all these things you can't believe anything anymore because everything is so easy google play apps has hundreds of of free apps where you can invent videos. You can just create shit. We live in the world now where everything is can be falsified. That's why I'm sticking with my old books. That's why my presentations on archaics will always be unique because I'm going to be separating fact from fiction. Before, before I bring things to you guys' attention, I have already run it through several filters. I don't just read something in a book. I'm not. I'm not one of these other YouTubers that re, that watches another YouTube video and then steals that idea, repackages it, and then just just gives it to you as, as a different flavor. No, it goes through several filters before I can put my name on it and say, "Hey, this right here is my conclusion on this right on, on, on all this material." And then I'm going to show you what books and what ideas and concepts led to that conclusion. But I don't take anything visual for evidence of anything. People are always getting frustrated with me in my emails because they send me all these links to videos. Hey, watch this. Watch this. Watch that. I respond to none of them. You can't show me something visual. If you're sending me an email asking me, hey, man, read this. Check it out. What it says. You got my attention. Hey, read this. What it is. Look, this is this is from this right here from 1883. This dude said this. I highlighted it for you. You got my attention, but you can't show me a video clip and think I'm ever going to be to marvel over them or even really give them more than a passing glance because I can't. I, there's no way for me to apply any of my filters. I can't do it. So, yeah, can't do it. Oh, man, she brought me some coffee. <laughs> Get those break free or die trying mugs, guys. We got 150 mugs left. We had a lot more, but we're getting down to the nitty gritty. Hmm. How do I know how many we had? Because this morning I went to the storage and got them. All right. <clears throat> Let's get back to this Q&A. Get back to this Q&A.
Moose74, please tell us about reincarnation and how to stop coming here and did we choose to come here? Okay, Moose, based off a lifetime of research and also because I have taken quite seriously the scientific material that has been published since the 60s, where different scientists in the UK and in the United States and Canada, yeah, Canada too, they have found that many young, young, uh, um, in between seven, eight, nine, ten year olds, could they knew intimate details about another family locally, and that it appeared that they were the reincarn they were the reincarnation of somebody who had passed away from a local family, and and they found out it was like wow, it's almost always local, or there's always some bridge between the the two families. And the perspective, the reason why so many kids are ignored when they when they say things that just stop adults for a minute and moms and dads look like, what in the hell are you talking about? Because they're not used because moms and dads aren't used to hearing a six or seven year old say something and try to say it from the vocabulary of a six or seven year old. But they're explaining something rather complex from the perspective of an 82 year old who had just died over and over it has been published that there is direct evidence direct evidence that young people are actually souls returned from elderly people who just recently passed away very locally so i can't i can't ignore thousands of conclusions, thousands of tests and all that, I have to accept that into my paradigm. So when I do, it makes sense to me. The oversoul would never condemn somebody to an eternal hell. The, Christ, the Christian model is fear programming. It would never condemn condemn a, a soul. Imagine an eight-year-old getting mowed down by a mail truck. That's pretty graphic. And I, I apologize if it offends some of you. But to illustrate my point, an eight-year-old hasn't even developed to even be judged yet. And then all of a sudden, it, it, eternal security is, okay, I get it. From the Christian perspective, they're just going to make up stuff on the fly. Even though it's not in the Bible, they're just going to say, oh, okay, well, you know, God's going to, you know, God's going to let that one go to heaven because they weren't old enough yet. Okay, well, what about the 15-year-old who already started experimenting with sex and got, and got run over by a Maserati? What are you going to say now? Are you going to make up? Or, well, okay, yeah, you know what? Uh, she might she might go to hell because she never accepted Jesus as her personal Lord and Savior, and she was already having sex. Oh my God! Yeah, you see, you see, there's no line of demarcation here. Every bit of it is subjective, so I don't buy into any of it. The only thing that a true and equitable oversoul would really do is give you multiple chances from multiple different perspectives. Then, then. It would be very, very virtuous for it to be able to judge you after you've lived 70 different lives, lifetimes. You've been a slave. You've been a mariner. You've been a banker. You've been a seamstress. You've been a potter. You've died on several battlefields as different ranking officers, as, as foot soldiers. You, you died screaming with 40 other poor bastards as, you got, as your Phoenician ship got sunk and you were chained to it because you were a galley slave whatever happened in that life sim at the end of a bunch of life sims your your immortal personality would have developed so many in so many different unique ways because you have lived from so many different unique perspectives i have already said on my channel before that i am an immortal and this is just a, an avatar my avatar at present is caucasian but that doesn't mean that I wasn't African in one of my life sims. It doesn't mean I wasn't I wasn't Maori at one time. It doesn't mean I wasn't a Zapotec warrior at one time. I could have died. I could have died in Finland in a civil war on the on the shield wall between different Viking clans in one in one life sim. In the very ne next life sim, because I had fully developed and whatever, I could have been a druid. I could have been a bard. I could have been a minstrel. I could have spent my life uh, uh, in Celtic force singing the truths of, of my ancestors, not even knowing that I was that ancestor at one time. 
I could have died in the civil rights movement in the 1960s and then come back as Jason in 1973. We are living life sims in an artificial construct that is here so we can grow and we can develop. And then when we make our exodus point, this world continues. The scriptures do not lie. Everything is forever. Your forever just won't be here because you've outgrown the construct. You need to go make your exodus point while everybody else reboots with the system. It's called a, se a systemic reset. You're going right back to Genesis if you're not ready. We've probably all done it multiple times. But on this time, we've been awakened. And as I've presented on my, on my channel before, if you're awake today, it's because you've been awakened. Not, not by anything that you have done. Something has deemed it necessary to wake you up. It's probably time for your exodus. And you're going to evolve and merge, and you're going to take. And as soon as you, as soon as you are not subject to the central nervous system, this filtering that that change you to this avatar, this avatar which is nothing but an extension of the construct itself. As soon as you are free of that. You're going to remember every relationship, every memory, everything you've ever done in that construct. It's all a part of you. Because in a holo field, no information is ever lost. It's never lost. In order to tap back into that information, you just need to change your coordinates. So what we're dealing with here is a construct that was put here by the Oversoul so you can do things you would never be able to do on the outside of the construct. Immortal beings will truly never grow if they never fear something, if they never experience something. Pain is the great instructor. That's why you're here. And as long as you understand that, there's really nothing to fear in here because there's really nothing happening here that's real. All right. <clears throat> Uh, how to stop coming here? Moose 74. You're asking me how to stop coming here. I'm sorry, man, but this is soul trap terminology that you're that you're trying to bring into our cakes. And I say this a lot. You guys need to leave the truther community garbage that you've picked up and leave that leave that outside. Don't come into my house with that because I don't buy into soul trap. I don't buy into any of that dungeon programming. You only speak from that perspective because you're not satisfied with the avatar and, and the way this avatar is being is 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 passing through the field right now. You're not you're dissatisfied with, with conditions, so you want to escape, but you're not understanding here. You are not your avatar. When this avatar is gone, you'll be given another one. Who knows? You uh, you might you might be the son of a well a wealthy oil baron. I don't know. You might you might believe me. We've both been male and female. I've also promoted that idea on my channel widely that I have not always been male. I've, I've played female too because it's the only way we will ever be able to absorb all multiple different perspectives and to mature, uh, mature all the way around as if we're both, if we're every single culture, every single race, every single time period and in both genders. Yeah. Our caves don't promote that third gender bullshit. There's two genders. Your sexuality is your business, but there's only two genders. Now, Yes, yeah, that's, that's that's very temporal thinking. How to stop coming here? That soul trap shit. I don't I don't buy into any of that. You're living life sims, and as soon as this life sim is over, and you're given a whole new avatar, another baby you grow into, you might love that life. That life might be so awesome. Who knows? You might be you might be the absolutely drop dead gorgeous, beautiful daughter of, of, of some type of of some type of uh, media mogul tycoon, and you never have to work a day in your life, and everything's just awesome. But but you spend most of your life in charities and, you, and you're an anomaly to your family and you're always doing, uh, you know, bringing up the vibration of everybody around you. And you start some awesome foundation that saves a whole lot of people and helps wake them up. Who knows? We just we just don't know. But that soul trap stuff is going to stay outside of our case. It's not coming in here. Nikki Baxter. Jason, have you have you heard of Wesley Tudor Pole? What do you think of his writing? I'm sorry, you'd have to send me an email and educate me to him. The only two door I really know is uh, France, Francis Tudor, and uh, 
they changed his name to Francis Bacon, but he's really a two door. He's he, he was a uh, his mama wasn't really faithful. She was kind of having she was trying she was kind of getting it on. The queen was getting it on with the uh, royal the royal seal holder, the the holder of the royal seal. Yeah, so yeah, Fran Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon is actually a Francis Tudor. Pavlov sheep. Any event linked to the start of the Chinese calendar uh, now in the year 4722? Okay. I'm glad you asked a calendrix question. I mean, that is my specialty. So I need to, uh, I need to be very, I need to make this very clear. You guys got to, you must remember I said this. We all, we all are going by mechanical time. And in mechanical time, we all understand, okay, midnight at uh, January 1st is the new year. But I'm telling you now, on the prophetic calendar, the new year is never January. The new year is never February. Technically, 2024 doesn't even begin till the vernal equinox. All New Year's begin at the vernal equinox. It is all these different, different, different. When the calendar has been modified and changed multiple times, this is what causes so much controversy and so much change. It is the Chinese year of the dragon. But technically, the year of the dragon doesn't begin till the vernal equinox. The vernal equinox was day one of the, of the old world's ancient, ancient calendar. And it was universal everywhere. And only by resets and cataclysms, the different civilizations splinter off and then create new, 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 new times for the new year. But the vernal equinox, that is day one of whatever calendar that you're studying. So technically, 2024 doesn't begin till till March 21st. Equally, the year of the dragon doesn't begin till March 21st. And I'm telling you now, all the chaos that's going to happen in this year isn't even going to unfold until after March 21st. Up until then, we're just going to get a bunch of weird random events. But then the 2024 events that I've been predicting, this, this chaos that's going to going to erupt, which is all by design. It's all controlled and there's nothing to fear about it. This is some, this is another thing to wake people up. It's the second seal, but it's going to have to unfold after March 21st. March 21st is day one of any, of any, of any, of any system you're trying to calculate on. Uh, here's, here's a part, here's a perfect example, a perfect example uh, in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, it specifically says that uh, uh, the great flood occurred, sun darkening, all this whole stuff. All this, uh, the world was destroyed in the flood on the seventeenth day of the second month. Set well, the seventeenth day of the second month is going to be May sixteenth or May seventeenth. Yeah, guys, it's a uh, uh, even in the old world, even in the old world, March began the new year. Oh, somebody said the Islamic calendar is Mar March 21st. I didn't know that. But I mean, that means the Islamic calendar actually went back to the ancient system. That's pretty interesting. That's pretty interesting. So the Islamic calendar. Well, I mean, there, there are other calendars too. I mean, I believe the Wiccan calendar also does that. It, 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 the old pagan calendar. Uh, adopts the the actual year the first New Year's is is the vernal equinox. You're you're welcome, Nikki. So unchained errant, you're right. You're anticipating me. I was going to mention that later, but you're but you're absolutely right, guys. It's no coincidence. Everything's taken off this year because it's the 33rd Olympiad. It's the 33rd Olympics. Yeah, you already know. Now, uh, 
47 to 60, add 60 would be 38, okay. To see. That's the, oh, that was the Pavlov sheep there, okay. Age of Discipline. Somebody named Age of Discipline. What's your thoughts on the thousand years of peace mentioned in the Bible? I've already answered that question. Uh, the thousand years is thrown out as a general term, meaning a long period of time. Dogman, how did humanity originally obtain the knowledge of the seals? Dogman, wow. Okay. Very difficult, very difficult to answer this. First of all, the official story, the official story is that the Apostle John was, was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, and he received a vision. And in that vision, he received the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is the book of Revelation. Now, I don't buy it. This is the official church version. The reason I don't buy it is because the church went into overdrive to suppress a story that was that is mentioned by, by, by some early writers that a man named Serenthus had preserved the old Sibylline oracle texts and had put them together and they were an apocalypse. And Serenthus had these organized into a book. And these earlier writers say that the writings of Serenthus, which are nothing but the pres preserved texts of the Sibyls, is the book of Revelation. For the church to go into overdrive to suppress this even today means they're covering something up. Do I believe that in the year 96 AD, 96, do I believe in the year 96 AD that uh, uh, the book of Revelation was brought to us, that John got it from the Isle of Patmos? No, no. I believe 96 AD was probably the time that, that uh, Serenthus had amassed those materials and put together the book of Revelation. 96 AD is also one of the years of the Nemesis X object. Oh, yes, it was. Very interesting. That chronology. Now, when it comes to the seals, you have to understand the Judeo-Christian world has painted the seals one way, painted the book of Revelation, the New Testament. But my big, my big aha moments is when I was realized, wait a minute, Paul's letters were only addressed to the seven cities in Greece. He names all seven cities. They're all Greek. I know that the original New Testament writings were written in Greek. They were only written in Aramaic and Hebrew later. They were, their originals are in Greek. So I'm like, why, if they're, if, if Greek was the, was the great language everybody spoke in the days of Jesus, Jesus spoke Greek too. So here it is. The international language of the time was Greek. The texts were written in Greek. The texts were addressed to people who were, who were in Greek major cities. And then I, I'm looking at all this and I put it together and say, wait a minute. If I, if I stick to the rabbinical interpretation, which is borrowed by the Christians, then nothing makes sense with the white horsemen and, and, the, and then the red horsemen. And then hey, this doesn't make sense. It's like, man, this, this, is, this is like a copy of an Old Testament Zechariah prophecy. It's, like a, it's, a, it's just a copy of it. But when you look at the Greek, I have a Spiro Zodhiades Greek, uh, Hebrew Greek interlinear key study Bible. So when you look at the Greek, I'm not talking about just actual translations of words, but when you look up, when you look up in a lexicon, the root words for each of those Greek words, and then you look at the, look at the syntax, how the words are put together, it's very inverted from English. The Romance languages are different. So I'm looking at, I'm looking at all this, and in Greek, I see a whole different message here. It doesn't mean anything that, that, that the Jews were trying to tell us these things mean. Nothing. It's not even similar. So I started looking at the book of Revelation through a Greek lens, and every bit of it makes sense. Then I had the mind explosion. Well, if that's true, wait a minute. How come everything we have in world in world history since the last reset, 1902, everything was going on? Everything's happened in four-year increments. So I'm, I'm looking at the world wars, and I'm looking at all these major events, the Vietnam War, and I'm like, wow, all these major events unfold during Olympic years. 
And that still didn't dawn on me. I said, damn, the Olympics are happening every four years too. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me. 2020. Absolutely. 2020 was a what well, was an Olympic year. I'm like, wait a minute. 2004's Olympics. Then somebody else put me on, somebody else put me on to, hey Jason, you need to check out the ceremony, the openings and the closing ceremony for the 2012 Olympics. I'm like, damn, there's the Olympics again. And then here I am, a chronologist studying eschatology, and only, only in 2023, in the last half of 2023, after spending 25 years of my life deep off into chronology, only six months ago, did I actually make the connection. Holy beep! The elite are operating on the ancient Greek Olympiad calendar, and now it all made sense. That's why it's so easy to see. And then and then my 25-year-old research on the Phoenix phenomenon and when it unfolds in 2040 perfectly fits on the Olympiad calendar. I'm like, there it is. There it is. It's amazing. So now, now, Greek mythology, my books, my book, The White Goddess by Robert Graves. Yeah, my book, uh, The Greek Myths by, uh, oh, Rufus. Oh, I can't remember his name now. Burton Raffle by Burton Raffle. I got a huge book, The Greek Myths by, by Burton Raffle. I've got, I've got The Greek Myths by Robert Graves and The White Goddess. Now those, now those books are extra valuable to me because now I can go in there and I can see, I'll say, oh, wow, these, this imagery in the book of Revelation is all coming out of Greek mythology. Greek mythology is the cipher by which we decode the apocalypse. It's all here. So you got some fascinating videos coming your way real soon. That was uh, Age of Discipline. No, that was Dog Man. That was Dog Man. Okay. Meta, 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 7. Okay. Meta, Meta, 7. Why does the Hebrew calendar start 134 years after your chronology begins? Okay. I said I was going to be patient, Meta. So I am. All right. I have a video. That's very conclusive. Data sets are published, so you can look up all the sources. But the Jews themselves, in their own encyclopedias, admit that they altered the calendar by 134 years intentionally to throw off Christians from being able to use the arithmetic in the book of Daniel to show that Jesus was the Messiah. This is according to rabbinical sources. This isn't Jason making this up. I have shown an overabundance of evidence, and I have two different videos. My last, one of the last videos I did on it was, uh, I'm going to show it to you right now. Shoot, I don't, know, I don't know why I'm sitting here talking about it. I can present on my screen, right? Add the stage. Let's, let's present this real quick. Let's go to it. Go right to it. Here's my channel dashboard. Right here, content, I believe it's going to be right here. I believe it was a live video I did, right? It was a real recent video, so it's going to be in the lives. Here it is right here. Here's the video. This is it. This video right here. This is, the, this is the video. Get that video. I'm going to turn it off. This is the video here. It's already got 29,000 views. This shows why the calendar is 134 years off. This is only the second one. I have an earlier one that goes into more detail about the Bar Kokhba Rebellion in 134 and 135 AD and how and how the rabbis back the rabbinate back then altered the calendar. Because I'm going to tell you now, the Jewish calendar is a fiction. There is no mention of the Jewish calendar anywhere in historical records until recently. And that's what this video is showing. The Jewish calendar isn't mentioned anywhere, even in Jewish sources. Not even Josephus mentions a Jewish calendar. <coughs> this date, 30, the begin date, 3761 BC right here, the Jewish calendar is a fiction. It, it's first appeared during, look at that. The very first time it ever appeared in a historical document is during the Protestant Reformation. There is no historicity to the, to the Jewish calendar. 
I, I've been, I, hey, uh, that's a uh, that's a debate issue. Meaning, I've I have I have put it out on social media that if anybody thinks they they're 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 qualified to debate this issue, I will overwhelm them with data showing that that the Jewish calendar is a total fiction. You might want to watch this video, my brother. I'm gonna get out of there. Stop sharing. All right, I'm back. Hope that answered your question. But it's a total fiction. Totally made up. Not one, not one of, not one of the, not one of the apostolic fathers, the early Christian, uh, early Christian fathers. None of the early Christian documents. Not Josephus. Not Philo Judaicus. None of them mentioned the Jewish calendar. None of them mentioned the the Jewish year. All of that was created not even five hundred years ago. So <clears throat> that was a uh, Meta Medi Seven. I know who you are. I've seen your little looks like a little kid smoking a cigarette. I know who you are. Okay, Josh White. How old is the present construct? I think the construct is ancient. It probably goes back tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. It could go back millions of our years inside the construct. How long have we been in here running this program? The program began in seven in seventy three forty. No, excuse me. It began in fifty two thirty nine B C. And I have many many charts showing you how every bit of this has unfolded. How how these dates have gotten. Uh, how how these dates were derived. Uh, fifty two thirty nine B C is the start date according to the Anuna. Anunnaki Nur calendar, an ancient an ancient system of factoring 600 year periods that by the days of Flavius Josephus was simply known as the Great Year, a 600 year period. So, um, I really don't know. I really don't know uh, how long we've been participating in here. I don't know. This is a program. The program is is made to be very very believable. The programming is packed with all kinds of basically residual programming. And what I mean is, is sometimes we find things called parts, out of place artifacts that don't belong in this version of the sim. They're actually fossils, programming fossils that, that belong to prior sims and they've been left over as residual. And for whatever reason, they were left as Easter eggs for us to find or the construct itself didn't think it was necessary to expend the energy to edit out 100% of everything. I don't know. I don't know. I will say this. 522 AD began the Dark Ages. 522 AD is the only year in all of world history that both the Phoenix phenomenon and the Nemesis X object appeared in the same year. It's the only year, 522 AD. 522 AD that began the Dark Ages could have literally began the Sim. And everything prior to 522 is 100% pure background programming to make the Sim more realistic. I'm on board with that. That would actually, that would actually answer for many other anomalies. Many other anomalies that are inexplicable. Um, so especially all these amazing mathematical patterns that I find that unfolded in the ancient world, repeat timelines, cross calendrical parallels, all of this. Every bit of it is evidence of a program delusion that we're participating in. But 522 AD seems to be the beginning of a lot of things. <clears throat> okay, guys. We still got plenty. We still got a lot, a lot of questions to respond to. Oh, create, create to real dad. All right, that's that's a pretty creative little handle. Create to real dad, Jason. How to deal with nihilism from from coming to your material and realizing everything is fake. First of all, I love it because it gives me great freedom to know that the oversoul was so caring that it would allow me to experience all this. Man, I've been a pirate. 
I, I've had to walk the plank. Probably got ate by a shark. I've had to do all these things all throughout my life, Sims. You have too. I love it that the Oversoul thought it was necessary that an immortal could experience all these things and actually fear death, fear be, being burned, fear when it's not even really happening. And that as soon as something happens to my avatar, I'm ejected from the construct. I'm recycled back into to, to enjoy a whole new avatar. It's like Pac-Man, but I got an unlimited amount, amount of avatars. I'm cool with it. I no longer fear the fact that that everything is fake. I used to, I used to like, man, I mean, listen, God, I told some really deep stuff about me in my in my video. Loki laughed at me. Not a lot of people have really watched that video. It's it's a it's a poem, but it's one written completely by me about my life. And I encoded a lot of things into that poem. It's called Loki Laugh at Me. But I made a, a deep, dark admission about myself when I came to that realization that everything was fake. Everything wasn't real. And where I was at in my life and what I was about to do. And then Loki laughed at me. And some people get it. Some people don't. I really don't care. But I put it out there for anybody who wants to search. But I was there at that threshold when I realized, man, none of this is real. Why even war, man? Why even care anymore? And then, like I said, Loki laughed at me and it opened up my eyes. And I realized, wait a minute, I've been looking at this obverse. I've been looking at this from a totally different perspective. This, this actually gives me an immense amount of freedom. I'm able to you employ my creativity, my, into, my, my highly individualized, informed field. I'm able to write the programming. Since it's all fake anyway, why can't I create a wealthy Jason? Why can't I have a badass Jeep Rubicon with all the bells and whistles looking like a monster truck going down the freeway? Why can't I do that? Why can't I have an 18 van with solar panels and all kinds of winches on the front look like a tactical SWAT vehicle everywhere I go that people don't even know? I'm not even government. That dude right there is an ex-con. Come out of prison. They don't even know. Look at my vehicle and you think I'm a fed. Why can't I do that? Why can't I ride down the highway on a badass fat boy Harley Davidson with all aftermarket stuff on there and look like a $200,000 bike? Why? Why can't I do it? I can. And I did. I started with a backpack living on a motorcycle with no bells and whistles on it. Yeah, with $27 in my pocket. Before I started applying, I can't even find my own books anymore, guys. I'm so I'm so disorganized. Got a whole bunch of books here. Before I started applying the very principles that I that I had already accepted to be true. I just hadn't started applying them yet. Now they're published and thousands and thousands of people all around the world are applying these principles and are reporting in the comment sections how it has completely changed the dynamics of their life. Once you understand it's all fake, you have a clean slate and you can employ the builder protocols to create the very life that you want to live. You can, you can actually expend so much creative energy that other people can enjoy and borrow from you. Yeah. You can modify your reality and touch the lives of others. It's awesome. Once you understand it's a clean slate, once you understand every bit of this is programming and that you're here to learn, grow, experience, and that there's really nothing to fear, that the programming dungeon protocols are just there to make it all more believable. But once you have matured to the point where, wow, I'm seeing with clarity now, I'm, on a, I'm in a Star Trek holodeck. And everything's available to me. I just have to, I just have to go through the protocols. It's very easy. In the construct, which is based off resistance, anything you try to force, an equal force is applied against you. This is why people get so frustrated. They they work and they tire, and they're like they're like that mule going going up that hill carrying a heavy load. That load never gets lighter, and the higher you get up to the hill, the more tired the mule gets. So the mule never gets to the top of the hill because it's exhausted before it's halfway there. The load never got lighter. But you, it's real easy for you to realize it's all artificial. Once you realize it's all artificial, there's no work for you to do. Work is artificial. So if the entire construct is a prison for your mind, 
then you would use your mind to modify the bars of the prison. Turn those bars into something malleable. It's very easy to understand. Once everything is fake, then you can play architect. You don't play builder because that, that, that puts you in the world of resistances. And there will always be an equal force applied to you that you try to, uh, that you try to force. You're an architect. You're a mental architect. You build what you want with your mind. And then your avatar, which surrounds you, but is also a part of the construct, moves in the direction of what you want. And the construct reacts to itself. It sees the avatar moving. Therefore, it infers what the immortal within is trying to do. From the construct extrapolates, it can extrapolate a tremendous amount of data based off your past, based off your personality, what you are, who you are. The construct may even be able to pull information out of your past avatars. It may be able to do that. It probably knows far more about you than you know yourself. Therefore, it can anticipate exactly what it is you're trying to do. And the builder protocols of the construct will build these things for you. It's when we apply force that we get force applied back to us. And this is the greatest frustration that, that I've seen other people have. They're not willing to just yet, yet give up. They still think they need to do something. They don't. You're an immortal being, and the only thing real here is your personality. Everything else is a part of the construct. Therefore, you need to use your personality. And the only way you can really use that is through imagination, empathy, and what else? What are my three keys? I, these are I'm talking to baby phoenixes, but my archaic veterans already know. Imagination, empathy, and intuition. Three, three spiritual qualities that have nothing to do with the construct. They have everything to do with who you are. And when you employ those three to build the world that you want to live and experience, the builder protocols will respond because that you're tapping into a neutral field. That neutral field will respond accordingly. But that neutral field will also put up barriers and resistances anytime you try to employ force because the act of trying to force something to, to happen is actually a projection of a lack of faith that it won't happen. There, that's why the force is required. I hope that answers that question, guys. Uh, how do you deal with nihilism from coming to your to your material uh, material and realizing everything is fake? I hope that answered your question. Awaken the immortal within would help you, but before you even order that book, I would wait months before you order that book. If you're new to my channel, and I would go to the We Immortals playlist in the in my in my podcast because in my podcast I go into great detail on spiritual things because that's what a lot of podcasters ask me questions about. So. Yeah. Dustin Marks. What is some evidence of the oversoul? Imagination. Imagination is the evidence of the oversoul. Imagination. Tell me what dog can imagine. Tell me what bird imagines. Tell me what creature in the world can, by virtue of imagination, actually build things in their mind that have not received any type of material, material substance yet. Whole concepts, philosophical system. Imagination can have us exploring worlds, even though the avatar hasn't moved at all. By virtue of imagination, I can do all kinds of things. I can even close my eyes and start traveling the construct, even though I'm not visually looking at it. By virtue of imagination, I can be still and I can and I can explore the past just like I can the future. Imagina imagination is what bridges me to the oversoul. I'm a piece of the oversoul. The greatest evidence of the oversoul is me. That's the greatest evidence I can provide. Mike C. Oh, Mike C., that's a moderator. What was the time frame from the Cro-Magnon and what ended them? Okay. That's a good question. Good question. Cro-Magnon buried their dead. They buried the chief possessions of the dead in the graves with them. They were very careful to pack in red ochre. 
They painted the dead with red ochre and filled the grave with red ochre before put, putting red dirt, red mud and dirt all over, all, all over the uh, Cro-Magnon. The Cro-Magnon believed in uh, life after death. That's, that's the whole reason why you bury the dead with their possessions. The red ochre is because that was the great, that was, that was basically how so many Cro-Magnon died. It's called the Phoenix phenomenon. But um, let's see. Cro-Magnon were hunted by Neanderthal. Scientists, I've said this on my channel a few times, in the, in the, uh, in the Anuna Files playlist, the Anunnaki playlist, the, uh, there are scientific, there are scientific uh, archaeological expeditions that have shown that Neanderthal camps, some of them have been found with piles called middens. These middens are full of Cro-Magnon bones, and there are flint knife marks and flint knives found at these sites, meaning that Cro-Magnon hunted and ate cannibalism, ate Cro-Magnon man. Now, the Cro-Magnons were fundamentally different than Neanderthal. Neanderthal were almost apish, tall, freak freakishly fast and strong. They were more animal than they were human. This is Neanderthal. But the Cro-Magnon, there's huge differences. One of them is cranial capacity. Also, the Cro-Magnon, most people don't know this, like the Magdalenian uh, Cro-Magnon, not only is the head huge, meaning that they were highly intelligent, but their anatomy is absolute proof of the sedentary race of high intelligence. The men were on average 18 inches taller than the females, meaning the females weren't out there trying to hunt for food, trying to survive. They had no reason to grow. They stayed they stayed small, petite, and beautiful. The females, anatomically perfect. Cro-Magnon females were equally beautiful as our be most beautiful women today. Cro-Magnon males were six foot two to seven foot tall. Cro-Magnon males, the CC capacity was about, I think it's 400 CCs on average, larger than what we have today. This is very interesting because Cro-Magnon males may have been super tall, but they had very short arms. And this is evidence of a sedentary race. It means that for a long period of time, they relied on engineering and technology. They had short arms. They weren't out there spearing things. They weren't fighting. They weren't doing it. I have often postulated on my own channel that Cro-Magnons were not tens of thousands of years ago. It was very recent history. And Cro-Magnons lost their technologically advanced infrastructure in an instant. In an instant. Their anatomy, their anatomy, their textiles, the way they weaved, the thread count on Cro-Magnon is unbelievable. Some of the art, art the Cro-Magnon art is the art not of a people who are wandering nomads. It is the people who understood the principles of art, and they used the, the contours of, of the caves to, for 3D effects on, on, their, on their paintings. We have Cro-Magnon is the evidence of a highly technologically very intelligent race of people who suddenly lost their entire world. They lost their entire infrastructure, and they were doing the exact same thing we find in the book of Revelation during the Phoenix phenomenon, Revelation chapter chapter six, the sixth seal, and everybody was hi hiding in the caves and under the rocks during the Phoenix phenomenon. Remember, it's red fallout, red ochre. All this happens, the sun goes dark, moon turns red as blood, red rain, red mud and fallout call, fall from the sky. And they hide in the caves. And when they come out of the caves, the world that they that they had just run away from was gone. They come out into a whole new world. They've lost everything. So now the cave is their new home until they can build more and they can recuperate. And inside the cave, one thing you don't lose, even if you lose your art and your infrastructure, one thing you don't lose is your art. So they anatomically perfect caribou and bison and, and bulls and, and aurochs. It's all here. It's all here. They, they painted them beautifully. 
Yeah, Cro-Magnon to me was not that far away. I believe that was probably the great Genesis reset that is 3895 BC was when the Cro-Magnon lost their entire infrastructure. Because we have on an authority of the of the Sumerian and Akkadian texts, we have on authority that humans, humans were here already even before the great Adamu uh, cataclysm. Remember, Adam comes from Adamu, which was just a general Semitic cuneiform term for man, mankind. But the Jews turned it into a pronoun. That was when they were. That was when they were. Oh, they were in their cat. Their Babylonian captivity. Yeah, Mike. See, I'm. I'm pretty convinced that. The uh, Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal were here in 3895 BC. Remember, there was a huge 400-year dark age after the appearance of Adam and Eve, quote, whatever, in 3895 BC to the appearance of, of uh, Enoch, who is Enki, in the Anuna in 3439 BC at the Gihon Flood. Remember, the Gihon Flood destroyed one-third of the world's population, so the world must have been very populated for it, for it to even mention that. That was 3439 BC. That's 400 years after the great after the great Phoenix Genesis reset of Adam and Eve. Squirrel sniper, I know you well. Uh, the young the young Egyptian panther priests were the only ones allowed below the Sphinx, but they had to go through the initiation ritual of circumcision. Any idea why they would? I can't really speak on that because I don't know anything about these panther priests you're talking about. Uh, the jaguar cult comes from ancient America. And for the panther priests to be in Egypt, I would have to say that there may be some crossover with the Sea People's Federation invasions that happened for over a hundred year period because we know Egypt was invaded twice. And maybe that cult came from the Americas because the jaguar and panther cults were, were American institutions originally. I have not read about them in, in, in Egypt. They, they must have come late in Egypt. Because uh, the jaguar and the panther were, were basically symbols for, for the watchers, the overseers. I don't know. I can't answer that, bro, because I don't know. I just don't know. I, did, I didn't know that anybody was allowed. I didn't know that. I've never seen a historical text that says that 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 anybody went under the Sphinx. In 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 more modern times, it's a real popular theory, but I haven't seen it that, that that there was anything to go under. I'm not saying it's not there. I'm pretty sure there are subterranean areas. As a matter of fact, Almianus Marcellinus, in uh, uh his his own, we only have one surviving copy of his work. But uh, Amianus Marcellinus said the entire Giza Plateau, the Great Pyramid Sphinx, was all riddled with underground chambers, and the original labyrinth of Minos is supposed to be under there as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm on board with the entire area being uh, subterranean galleries of rock. I just don't have any, I don't have any recollection of any texts that talk about what you're referring to. Jerome O'Connell, Jason, are the prophecies. Pharisees related to the Phoenix. Are the prophecies to the Pharisees related to the Phoenix? Thank you, sir. I'm sorry, Jerome. This is are the prophecies to the Pharisees related to the Phoenix? Uh, I don't know, man. I, I I don't even know how to how to how, I don't know how to make it. I don't know how to. I don't know how to interpret that. Are the prophecies related to the Phoenix? Yes. You spell Pharaoh C's with a J in it. I don't know what this word is. I don't know. The Phoenix is in prophecy everywhere. Everywhere. Uh, my, my Phoenix playlist, at it is overwhelming the amount of data we have for the Phoenix. It's overwhelming. And the very fact that no one in the world has brought this to your attention, but an ex-con who sat in a prison cell for 26 years should, should be a very eye-opening. Why has all of academia completely shunned this and completely shelved it and not showed you? Because they've all read the same text I have. We only have a limited number of ancient texts to pull data from. So, yeah, it's crazy. How the hell could they all ignore this? <clears throat> Anthony Smith, could current tech like DARPA 
allow us to remove vapor canopy if it forms? I'm going to let you answer your own question, uh, Anthony Smith. A vapor canopy is formed by volcanism. Ash, pumice, gases appear appear in the mesosphere. The mesosphere is a layer of the atmosphere that has that is suspended water droplets. They're going to latch on to and hold on to anything that goes in that in that area. It's very very thick. Once that area fills up with two things, one is ash and pumice coming in detritus coming from volcanoes boiling under the oceans, sending steam up, and on land, sending ash and pumice up. Now, the second layering of the mesosphere is the fine red dust that comes from Phoenix. Every time Phoenix comes, it layers the world in red dust. In some areas, it's red mud. In some areas, it's red rain. But every time it turns the moon red as blood. So this, uh, I'm going to let you answer your own question. If the mesosphere is absolutely packed with this red, this red dust, cosmic dust, call it whatever you want to, the red dust and the atmosphere, uh, the pumice and all that, and the whole world is suffering this, is there a technology that exists that can clean that out? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But it seems from the historical record, it seems to me from the historical record that the longest that a vapor canopy has ever lasted was about 400 years. Even in the great, even in the antediluvian period, the great flood period, there were two canopies. There were two canopies at that time. I, I don't know about, I call it the vapor canopy period because at one time I believed that the entire pre-flood world was one canopy. It's not, it's not. We have evidence, we have evidence that the canopy, the canopy, disappeared for a while and then it reappeared for 408 years before the great flood but i don't know so oh kimberly wildwoods new world dolls been on archaics for a long time very curious if you know anything or have any information on the Ogdoad. well the egyptian Ogdoad. is the original eight you know whatever demigods that a lot of christians uh a lot of christians have connected the Ogdoad to noah nama uh him uh, shem ham and jephath and their three wives claiming that okay in the christian story in the in judeo in J, J, excuse me judeo christianity we have the eight survivors of the ark of noah some people have made the correlate that, okay, the Egyptian Ogdoad is proof because the Egyptians believe that in the beginning, uh, the, very the very first demigods were, were numbered in eight. So, But they were superseded by what we call the Aeneid. The Aeneid was the nine gods. And remember, it's very unusual. It's very unusual that ancient Egypt would not even lay any importance to the sun. Remember, we had a vapor canopy. That's why. It didn't lay any importance to the sun. In ancient Egypt, only the goddess was important. And then all of a sudden, at the very end of the period of the Aeneid, after the nine gods were well established, at the very end, all of a sudden, Horus comes out. He represents the sun at the same time in history that the Sumerian pantheon is shook up with a new god. A new god is added to the ancient Sumerian Sumerian pantheon right below the Sumerians collapsed and disappeared as a culture. That new god was Utu Shamash. Utu Shamash was the sun, which was the last of the Sumerian gods added to the ancient pantheon. And the, and the reason is, is because the, the, the vapor canopy collapsed. When the vapor canopy collapsed, the sun was visible. So, and everybody added the sun. And this is why the ancient American calendars started started the sun ages. The very, very first ancient American sun calendar was what? It was the water sun. It was the vapor canopy sun. So, yeah. <clears throat> Let's see where I'm at. Two hours and 22 minutes. We still got plenty of time. Plenty of time. J.J. Stone El Dorado says Shakespeare did not exist. I don't know if he existed or not, but I know you can go to a King James authorized version Bible and you can go to Psalms, Psalm 46 and you can count down 46 words to the word spear. 
and you can go to the bottom of Psalms 46 and you can count 46 words up to the word shake and they're right there next to each other. Shakespeare, I don't know if Shakespeare existed or not, but I'm pretty sure Bacon had a lot to do with editing that Bible or at least Psalms 46. All right. Next question. Oh, Kim, this is, is this uh, The Great Falling Away? Is that somebody's name? The Great Falling Away? Jason, was the dark satellite created by the simulacrum or by beings? I've already answered this. That's my very first, well, that was on my first question. No, the dark satellite is not the winged disc. That's the phoenix. The phoenix has wings. The phoenix has wings. Zechariah Sitchin tried to tell everybody Nibiru. The winged disc is always Nibiru. That is not true. It is not true at all. It has always been the phoenix. Is that true? Zechariah Sitchin, man, the more the more and more I, I look at his material, the more and more dis, dis, he's a disinfo agent. Yeah. When he talks about archaeology, those places are real. He talks about ancient texts and stuff. Okay, those, those texts are real. But then he gives us these weird-ass translations. Yeah, don't, don't make, yeah, you have to understand, guys. Samuel Noah Kramer, I showed you the book a minute ago. Samuel Noah Kramer, Maureen Gallery Kovacs, Thor Heyerdahl, um, George Smith. Oh, there's so many. Professor Waddell. None of these people would agree with Zechariah Sitchin. None of them. Even today, there are no scholars and no translators and academics that will endorse Zechariah Sitchin. No, because they know he's full of shit. The only people that buy into that stuff is the truth of community. It's crazy. Full of shit. Made up all, he made up all that stuff. <clears throat> now, no, the winged disc, that's, that's almost always the phoenix. And in fact, many times, the Egyptian versions of the winged disc is always red. Paul S., you wrote some of your books quite a while ago. Do you still find new data points after the fact? My whole channel is packed with new data points. If my books were all rewritten, they would be fundamentally different. They would have the exact same years, the exact same chronologies, but they would be they would just overwhelm people with data for each point now. Yeah, my books, my books are really good for, for new people and beginners to understand and familiarize themselves with them because people who have read my books can now go to my channel and have these mind explosions because they're already familiar with the material. Uh, in the basic. But yes, you're absolutely correct. All my books are old. In fact, I was in the research game 20 years ago. I was getting books, I was getting articles published 20 years ago. Seven, 17, 18 years ago, I got my first book published. And then after that, I've had multiple books published. And yeah, me coming to YouTube three and a half years ago only, only means I started doing videos recently. But when it comes to the acquisition of material and the dissemination of information in very, very comprehensive data sets. I've been doing that for years, for years. And uh, those books are valuable. They are good, but they could be way, way better. Let's see. <clears throat> Flip one. Somebody named Flip one. Okay, what year did the Smilacrum take hold? I don't know. Ar the Archaics Paradigm. My data only goes back to 5239 BC. 5239 BC is the first year of the Anunnaki Nerd Chronology, and I've documented that tremendously. You got, I've got a whole playlist that goes into it. So, uh, but I'm on board. I'm on board with this construct actually being rebooted the last time in 522 AD. And that everything before that is background pro programming. And that when we get reset in the near future, when we go in the near, I'm, from your perspective, when we, I can't even tell how, how you can see me. But uh, in the near future, when we get rebooted and reset, and some of us make it our exodus, the rest of us have to go through it again. When we go back, we may only be going back to 522 AD, the great. Justinian plague and darkness period, which started the dark ages. 522 may be the reset, reboot period that we go back to. And everything before that is just background programming. 
all that's already been there and it's been studied and we're able to, by virtue of imagination and research and, and, and our studies, put all that back together the way we put it together today. We may have done this thousands of times. Okay, Jerome O'Connell. Jason, what are your understandings or theories why entire cities' populations vanish without a trace during Phoenix cycles? Thank you for this Q&A. Oh, uh, the very first, now I was already on board with the Phoenix phenomenon, creating edits and vanishing whole areas. But then there was things that were that, that my attention was being drawn to that just didn't make sense, such as uh, in Gibbon's work. I have all of Gibbon's work here. Six volumes from the 18, 1803. All of Gibbon, which was written way before 1803. But uh, I have the 1803 editions of Gibbon uh, the the history and decline of the Roman Empire, and he goes into how the Dacians, as an entire civilization and culture, just vanished. And I, I, I've read more about the Dacians, and I'm like, wow, man. So I keep finding whole areas of the world for which no history can be found anymore. And what I find is, is centuries later, different authors just make up things. Oh, okay, Genghis Khan. Gen Genghis Khan and all his men came in here and tore and, 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 and took it all out. I'm like, damn, Genghis Khan was on the, was way over here doing all that. And Kaluka Khan was over here. And it's like, wait a minute. So, something's not adding up. So I see these references over and over to civilizations that only, only in ex post facto writings do I find that historians are theorizing why certain people disappeared. Oh, there, there was an earthquake and they all vanished into the sea. Yeah. But you wrote that a hundred years ago and there, and there's no chain of custody on this information. This is the problem I have with a whole lot of historians. You've got to have a chain of custody on your data to, to, for, for people to understand what I'm talking about. Oh, uh, I recently did a video about Graham Hancock and this is the video here. You need to see it because this, this shows you a chain of custody on data. This right here is an unbroken chain of information showing that Atlantis could have never been 9,600 BC, like Graham Hancock is so, is so popular with theorizing all the time. He asserts it as fact, as, as if it's just, just known, and he totally ignores this data. Let me show you, let me show you what a chain of custody on data looks like. I'm going to show it to you right now. It's on my YouTube channel. Thank you, Unchained Aaron. 2040. So we're going to share screen again. I'm going to disappear. Here's the entire screen. We're going to share this right here. Let me go back to my YouTube channel and show you this video. Because in the description box, I gave you the business. And I kind of wanted Graham Hancock to see it too. So let's go to my videos. Uh, you know what? I don't know if it's alive or what, so I'm just going to put Atlantis. See what it pops up. There it is. A total dismantling of Hancock's 9,600 BC deal. So here it is right here. Oh, uh, I'm in my studio. Let me go to the actual video. Here it is. All right, so a total dismantling of Hancock's 9,600 BC Atlantis dating. I'm showing you this right here because I want you to see what an unbroken chain of custody looks like for for a uh, the oh oh it must be here in the um oh man why is this happening to me today maybe it was a podia man, oh did I did I provide it as a podia deal because. I don't have a pinned comment here, and it was in the pinned comment. Damn it, man. I didn't pin the comment. I made a comment where I put the whole data set in the comment, and the comment must have went all the way to the bottom of the thread. I don't see it anywhere. Damn it, man. Look at this thread. It's a huge thread. It just goes and goes. I see a bunch of you in here. Damn it, I hate that. Maybe that's why. 
because the uh, the entire data set was published in the, in the uh, comment I made, but I didn't pin the comment, so we got shoved to the bottom somewhere. I can't see it anywhere. But it's an amazing data set. My God, this just goes and goes and goes. I don't see I don't see my little symbol anywhere. Oh my God, this is embarrassing. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces. I don't see my comment anywhere. How did my comment just vanish off YouTube? The whole data set's in there for everybody to read. That's the bottom of it. And I, I, there's my comments nowhere to be seen. I'll be damned. Well, that is disturbing. So you know what? I might be wrong about something. Hold on. Let me let me let me do this Atlantis again real quick. I may I may be at the wrong video. There it is. Yeah, here it is right here. Calling out all the critics. I'm sorry, guys. I took you to the wrong video. Okay. Here it is right here. Chain of custody. Atlantis authors, chain of custody. We're going to go into this right here, guys. I'm going to I'm going to blow this up for you to see it better. You see at the top, Plato, 200 years after Solon, who heard it from priests, who interpreted it from inscriptions. That right there is already two or three filters that the story came through. Then Aristotle was student of Plato and his intellectual superior. Aristotle dismissed the Atlantis, Atlantis narrative. Third item, Philo mentioned Atlantis, but this was 300 years after Plato and only mentions what he read in Plato. The reason I provided this is because everybody only has Plato to mention. Christian authors 500 years after Plato began referencing Atlantis, but it was always in reference back to Plato. 700 years later, Proclus, a Neoplatonist of the 5th century AD, claims that Crantor also visited Egypt and confirmed Plato's, Plato's story. But we don't have these writings from Crantor, and this does not support the 9,000 years in, uh, instead of 9,000 months system used by the Egyptians. So then, Middle Ages, Renaissance, Golden Dawn Society, Helena Blavatsky, Edgar Cayce, all added untrue details. But here's what we get in the data set. Egyptian years were equal to our 30 days. Look, this is a data set right here. Egyptian years were equal to our 30 days. The priests of Neith at Sais only employed a lunar calendar. This is according to historians and archaeologists. Eudoxus of Nidos said it was not 9,000 years. It was 9,000 months. So did Diodorus Siculus, Lactantius, Plutarch, Macrobius. Manathel's 9,000 years was corrected by Africanus as 9,000 months. So this is a chain of custody, guys. Thomas Braderween in 1340 AD. Pierre Diali, Pedro Sarmiento Galboa, Augustine Zarotti. Uh, Eugenius Philolethes, John Jackson, 1752. Uh, so anyway, this is the chain of custody. And then I even provide the sources. Here are your sources at the bottom. The so all the different books that this came out of and additional details. So that's a chain of custody, guys. Let me get out of there. That's a chain of custody. And let me see what's going on here. My mouse may be about to die there. All right. So that is a chain of custody of data. It's an amazing amount. Of, it's an amazing amount of data. I just went over it real fast, but it show, but it just shows you this is a, a, there's so many researchers that just pull a piece out and then they ride with it as if there is an other material out there that easily gives you more information about what you're trying to convey. And this is something that Graham Hancock does not do. Graham Hancock completely ignores every ancient source to be able to provide you that one mistake that even ancient authors called was a mistake. Graham Hancock ignores it all. Do you think, do you think he just doesn't know about these other 35 sources? Absolutely not. His bibliographies in his published books show that he's very well aware of those, uh, of those authors. Yeah. 
Yeah, guys, you gotta you gotta understand. I told you, Archaics 2024. I'm calling out the shields. I'm not I'm not gonna sit here and just get aggressive with it and go over. But I'm gonna call spade a spade, and it's every time. Okay, so yeah, I mean, I don't go into Tartarian theory and history and all that, but I, I'm going to tell you now. I have seen old maps, Martin Lakey. I think I think a Static in the Attic. I've seen old maps that say Tartaria on them. I've seen them, so I don't I don't know anything about Tartaria research because I haven't been been able to find anything in the history books. So, but I will say this. Tartaria could be one of those civilizations that was completely wiped out in a Phoenix edit as well. I don't know. I just don't know. So, uh, Aona Rose, Rose, Aona Rose, can you speak your view of the Maui meltdown, please? What happened in Maui doesn't seem to be any indifferent than what's been happening to thousands of locations in Canada, uh, uh, some in Alaska, and especially in uh, the United States. Western United States, thousands of these fires that just inexplicably, inexplicably appeared. Yeah, bushes and trees unburned, but all the houses, all the houses burned, vehicles melted, all that. Yeah, guys, no, nothing natural about that. Now, is it of human manufacture? I don't know. Is it AIX? Is it artificial intelligence X doing that? It very well could be. I don't know. It could be, it could be the construct doing it. It may not be anything. Uh, you, I mean, you. Humans, even among the elite, may be mystified by it as well. I don't know. Is it natural? Hell no. Martin Hart. Have you read The Second Coming of Christ by Paramanasa Yogananda? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. But I will say this. I watched a video by Pro... Praveen Mo, Mohan the other day, India. I really like that guy. I, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling his spirit. I, li I like the way he conveys information. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, I tell you guys all the time, I fall in love with personalities. I don't give a damn about anything else. All the rest is dressing anyway. Fall in love with personalities. I listened to one vid video by Pra Praveen. I was like, wow. I even told Dawn, hey, man, I really like this guy. This, uh, uh, I might reach out to him. I might reach out to him. Joel Watson, do you forecast blackouts, internet crash for 2024? Technically, 2024 isn't, isn't over until March 20th, but it could happen. But I'm going to tell you this. These predictions also go by magnitude. 2023 had more, more systemic blackouts and internet outages than any year before. Added up all over France, parts of Germany, Europe, Australia. There were blackouts, rolling blackouts, this all through 2023. And just because the rest of the world is up and running doesn't mean that prediction about, about blackouts is totally untrue. It all goes by magnitude. There was a lot of blackouts. There was a lot of internet outages all through 2023. 2023 is technically not over for another two months. <clears throat> Remember, guys, the truth is in the modern calendar. The truth is here. It's in the modern calendar. September, October, November, and December, you know, we know that that in our mechani me mechanistic calendar, it's the 9th, 10th, and 11th, 12th month. But that's not what they're called. The actual Latin for September, septi, October, octo, November, Nevi, was it Nevi or Nevi, Novo or something? And then Desi for December, that's not 9, 10, 11, and 12 at all, at all. That's 7, 8, 9, and 10. Therefore, January is 11 and February is 12. So let's see here. Yeah, if anybody knows Praveen, I'd like to talk to him. I'd like to, I'd like to talk to him. I still I still need to reach out to uh um uh, I'm so man. 
Roger Roger of Mud Fossil University. I still need to reach out to him. I like him too. It's all uh, um I've just been so busy. Oh, Paul Cook as well. I, a matter of fact, I, uh, Paul Cook was given my my email. I I, I answered I answered his comment, giving him my email. I don't know. I don't think he he hasn't responded. Paul Cook's on my list too. And my buddy Martin. I need my buddy Martin back on the show. Let's see. I'm looking at. Oh, but yes, Joel Watson, you deserve a better answer than that. I went into defense mode about 2023. Joel Watson said, do you forecast blackouts, internet crash for 2024? What I forecast is when these events begin unfolding with all these migrant violence and all this stuff that's going on, I believe that all these cells that have been put all over the world by Soros Foundation and all them, when they take off during the Olympics, well, uh, uh, after or, or right after the Olympics deals, I believe that there's going to be news blackouts. They're not going to be telling the truth a, a, as to what happens. I also believe that uh, the primary victims are going to be Jewish by these Muslim cells at first. Then they're going to run out of those as victims. They're going to turn around and turn on the nations that have hosted them. France, Germany, uh, whatever European countries have a whole bunch of migrants in there, especially the UK and all that. But their first order of business is going to be against Jews. This is this is all by design, guys. Every bit of this is, is scripted. It's all scripted. This is what's going down in uh, 2024. This is the breaking of the second seal. Uh, a huge conflict that's going to draw in all three Abrahamic religions. Creatu Realidad. This is your second question. Jason, will you do a video for, of predictions for 2024? Absolutely. Absolutely. But like I said, the reason, look, all these other people have put all these predictions videos out. They're really vague. Everybody says, everybody says, oh, 2024 is going to be a smasher. 2024 is going to be uh, uh, crazy. No one's ready for what's going to happen in 2024. But nobody's saying what's going to happen in 2024. They're not. But 2024 doesn't even start for two more months. So I feel I feel I don't feel in any hurry to release my own. I will release it when I feel inspired to do so because that's when it's going to be the most compelling. So let's uh but yeah, I'm already I'm already putting it together and I'm already looking at a look looking at a bunch of stuff. That's done. In the temple of Hathor, oh, oh, Kimberly Wildwoods. In the temple of Hathor. Who were the Ogdoad creation myth? I don't know. I don't know. That's the cow goddess. That's the cow goddess. And remember, when the Israelites left Egypt, they were worshiping the goddess. When they made it to Canaan, they didn't switch over. But they only honored Baal as the son of Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth Karnaim was a, was a very popular Israelite city. So it's a, a Hathor. Hathor in Egypt become, becomes Io, Io, yo, this is the, when the Israelites became the Ionians, they were still, they were still venerating the goddess when it came out of Egypt. The male, the male gods were seen as subservient to, to the goddess. Barfling Arcane, that's a hell of a name. Okay, I've already got into Oannies. Okay, I've already answered yours. Victoria, awake. Explain what being ready means when the phoenix comes. Well, <coughs> that's a good one. Because the answer to this is multifaceted. And what I, what I mean is, is I'm not, I'm not trying to bullshit you. It's a really good question. But being ready entirely depends on who you are. What I mean is, is when 2040 comes, I'm not going to prepare. 
I'm not I'm not preparing for anything because I believe 100 percent that the oversoul is always going to provide a way or an out. And that even means if two or three months before May of 2040 comes around and all of a sudden I feel really inspired to maybe stack up three or four months worth of food and water, then that's what I'm going to do. But at this point, with it with it still 16.4.3 mi- uh, uh, years away, I don't feel compelled to do that right now. I don't feel compelled to go travel to another part of the world. I know that. But when the oversoul inspires me to do something, I'm going to listen. I'm going to be very hypersensitive to anything around 2038 and 2039, and I'm going to pay attention to it. But if I don't feel compelled to do something, then wherever I am is a good place. It's a matter of perspective. If you're not really spiritually in tune, if you if you just don't really have that strong connection to source, and if you don't feel that you're going to be able to develop that in time, then you're going to be thinking more more materialistically. You're going to be thinking of bump bunkers and hiding and storing up years worth of food and all this stuff. It all depends on who you are, how we answer this question. Brandy Rockhart, the Essene Gospel of Peace. <coughs> uh, I don't know what that is. I probably, if it's a part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, I've read it. I just don't remember. I remember, remember that title, the Essene Gospel of Peace. And it's just a question mark. I don't know. I don't know. I, I find value in all different texts. All di- There's value to be derived from almost every ancient text. Meta Medi 7 again. Why does the Hebrew calendar start? Oh, I've already, I've, somebody's already answered. Jose Vasquez. Jason, can you tell us again what BC and AD stand for? Okay, look, these are arbitrary designations. These are 100%. In 526 AD, an agent of Rome named, named Sosigenes designed a new calendar. The new calendar was the Anno Domini calendar, the year of the Lord calendar, and it backdated to what he thought was the birth of Jesus Christ. So it started this new calendar called Anno Domini, and the church adopted it. Then it took 350 years for the rest of Europe to, to adopt it. It was never a popular calendar from the beginning. They were still going by the older Roman Julian count. So this, uh, um, AD. Well, writers 200 to 300 years after it was adopted, they needed a designation for, they needed a designation for uh, what was the, what, what, how many years back was it before Jesus was born? So they added BC. Many of them, I think Sir Isaac Newton was the first one. I believe I read that Isaac Newton was the very first chronologist to use the designation BC. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. I just remember reading that recently. But uh, Isaac Newton was um, uh, around Isaac Newton's time. They started putting BC for any years before Christ because that's what it was. They said BC was before Christ. But as we get more intellectually advanced and, and scholarship moves on, they've changed that. It's no law. It's no longer uh, before Christ. It's no longer uh, uh, after death, that was a very popular theory, but it's not. It's Anno Domini, year of the Lord, A.D. Then B.C. was before Christ, but B.C. before Christ has been changed by academia. Now it's B.C.E., which is before common era, and A.D. has been changed to C.E., which is common era. It's the exact same calendar. It's the exact same system going forward and backward in time. It's just academia has changed it to to basically take the calendar away from the person of Jesus. So, also, keep in mind, 59... Oh, uh, somebody just mentioned 59, eight, uh, uh, 18. Yeah. There, thank you, Magic Nova. It will be the year 59, 18, uh, come the vernal equinox. We're still in 59, 17 right now. Okay. <clears throat> Karen Hardy, 
Would you like to, uh, would like to hear Jason's insights on Philip K. Dick, 77 lecture, please. I haven't listened to any Philip K. Dick. I'm only aware vicariously through other people who have told me about Philip K. Dick and his experiences. Uh, I think I read an article about him. I did. I never, you have to understand it. What I didn't, I didn't, when I was in prison, I wasn't on board with simulation theory. I was on board with a, with some magical, magical construct that was built by God and controlled by Jesus. I remember I was a Southern Baptist Christian for the first 40 years of my life. When I did most of my research, I was very, very Christian. And this, even though I saw how beautiful these mathematical relationships were, I was just thinking, well, that's, that's the spirit. That's how the spirit put it together. And I still believe that. I just understand now that it's 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 a simulation. It's it's 100% a spiritual technology. But I'm not um I I wasn't I just Philip K K Duke didn't come on my on my radar till like a, a year after I'd already started my channel and I'm just not really into cross pollination. I don't want to cross contaminate. I don't want others to uh uh to assume that I borrowed their material from my, I've already got many of trolls and haters. I don't even know where they come from, where, which which claim that I, I stole their sh their shit, and that's why Archaics is so popular. It's just absolutely ridiculous. I don't have time to watch anybody else's videos, really, but uh, especially when I first started my channel and I was working full time while I was uploading videos. Yeah, for for my baby phoenixes, you may not know it, but I had three hundred videos on YouTube before I even had a thousand subs. Yeah, it's uh. I did go, I did blow up fast in the last 18 months. But 18 months before that, it was real slow going. And I was working full time while I was doing YouTube. So uh yeah, Philip K. Dick, I heard about his experience. Something about he he answered the his front door and then he just saw another dimension, something happened, somebody was delivering a package, something like that. And yeah, he seems to be a real phenomenal guy. I just don't know much about him. Lady Sar, oh, Lady Sarcastro. Thank you, thank you, Lady Sarcastro. Being in a simulation, does that mean possession, mental health issues, etc., are really computer viruses and exorcisms are like antivirus software? I don't know because antivirus software and computer viruses is still a very materialistic way of viewing reality. If this is all programming and it's a part of a spiritual technology, then there's other things involved. These are just the labels that we attribute to them. Hell, you got a lot of people claiming viruses don't even exist. So, oh, uh, I don't know. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah, um, the very fact that if you can wrap your mind around the fact that you are an immortal being and that this avatar is a part of the programming of the construct itself, then the immortal within isn't infected by anything that, that happens to the avatar. But if you actually hold, subscribe to the belief that you are your body or that your body is a part of who you truly are, then what the body suffers can also contaminate the spirit because it all has everything to do with the mind. Yeah. The only product a spirit has is thinking. That's it. That's it. So the only so the only thing that a spirit can do is thought. Well, if that's the case, if that's the case, thought is the great is the great power you wield inside the construct. Start thinking about how awesome life is while you're healthy. And I guarantee you that the programming of the avatar will start correcting the problem because the avatar is going to reflect what the spirit projects. If the spirit is projecting health, even though the avatar is unhealthy, then that the bridge between health, health, a healthy spirit and an unhealthy avatar is going to be corrected. The construct is always going is always going to reflect back a circumstance what the eternal spirit within projects. This is what you got to do. My, my book, Awaken the Immortal Within. Listen, if you can't afford a ten dollar book, that's cool. You can contact Don. We 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 have free PDFs. So this is something you got to do. Let's see. I'm uh. Who is this? That was Karen Hart, Lady Sarcom 
Lady Sarcastro. Okay, Jojo Schumann, is there any chance the timeline has sped up? Other errants, and I and I feel this, I totally disagree. I agree that you feel this, and I also agree that the construct wants you to feel unhinged. It wants to take that stability away from you. Yeah, but has time actually sped up? I don't believe that at all. I believe we're exactly in, in the timeline right where we need to be right now. I don't... All, all this, this is dungeon programming. Remember, in dungeon programming, it, the construct wants you to dis, want, want you to believe that the world is absolutely real. However, however, artificial intelligence X is this is this needling. It is this dun, it is this agitator that tries to get you to disbelieve that you are you are separate from the very reality that you're experiencing. It wants you to believe that you're the avatar, not the immortal within. And it will do anything, even, even in inducing psychoses, even creating mass hysteria, create, creating, creating holographic monsters to show up in a shopping mall in Florida. It will do whatever necessary to get as many people involved as possible in to disbelieving their reality. Because once you disbelieve that everything is okay, then it can start inserting all kinds of, of little dungeon seeds that will grow into all kinds of further instabilities. Now you got to be that rock. You got to be that pillar. You got to, you got to be that milestone in everybody else's lives so they can gravitate around you. They can have something that they can more to. Yeah. You got to be strong. You can't let all, all this weird truth or community whims and weird theories and all this crap just take, just rip you up and take you away. Every single thing you come in contact, you need to weigh it against the balance. Just sit there and think. A little bit of critical thinking about everything is, is going to unveil the truth every time. Every time. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done with almost everybody out there. I'm just sick of it. Sick of it. It's so contaminated. There's a few, there's a few I love. I'm going to keep them in my inner circle. Other than that, it's like, it's terrible. It's just terrible, man. Remember, when you when you entertain ideas like this, like Fomenko trying to convince everybody, man, that we're missing we're missing centuries, thousand years. Now, I'm a chronologist; I can show you it all, and I have. My, the the patterns are absolutely beautiful, and they stay fixed. So there's no there's no yeah, it's it's just crazy. But you have to have that faith that the oversoul is in control, because if you were to entertain otherwise, then you're actually you're actually putting out the spiritual energy that you don't believe the oversoul has your back. And once you're putting that out, AIX can do whatever it wants to you. And you can still consider yourself allied to God while you're actually allied to, to the control system. Yeah. Remember, guys, who were the crowds of people around those women that were screaming for their lives and they were burning at the stake? Remember, it was Christians. People who thought they were allied to God doing the right thing as they sat there and burned alive innocent people. You don't want to be one of them. <clears throat> Should we expect to see giants again? In a vapor canopy scenario, you can. In any situation of high volcanism, when there's a high concentration of volcanism going around the world, giantism, giantism reappears in the world, in the insects, in the plants, and humans. For my, for, for my baby phoenixes, if you don't know, we have it in the historical record in the year 1902, which was a phoenix year, on the island of Martinique at St. Pierre. <coughs> Excuse me. A volcano incinerated 40,000 people in minutes. Every single person in the city died, except one convicted felon who was sentenced to death, named August. His, his story was so unbelievable, the one sentenced to death was put in a pit in a dungeon, waiting for his execution when the volcano exploded and kill, killed 100% of the people in the city, 40,000 people. Blew the ships over. This is the month of May, 1902. It's a Phoenix year on the 138-year periodicity of the Phoenix chronology. That one man, August, was such an anomaly that he was pardoned. 
And then he spent the rest of his life traveling with the Barnum Circus around America. And they had a whole exhibit about the one sole survivor of the great, the great horror of, of St. Martinique. Oh, by the way, the reason I'm telling you about that is because after the explosion, two scientists, one in their late 50s and one in their early 60s, went to St. Martinique and studied the volcano and the after effects. And it took a while before they realized that both of them exposed to the ambient radiation from the volcano, both men grew two inches. The Phoenix phenomenon in volcanism is the reason we had titans and giants in the ancient world, not the Babylonian version. Somebody asked me recently, hey man, what do you think about Gary, uh, I can't remember his name, the dude that wrote Genesis 6, the angels. Listen, I said, man, I don't. I used to be that guy that believed that mythological stuff. I don't believe that no more. No angels came down from heaven, had sex with human women, and gave birth to giants. That is the Babylonian version of history copied by the Jews when they wrote the books of Enoch, the book of Second Enoch. When they, when all, it's None of it's true. In the Old Testament, when we had the races of the giants, the Rephaims, the Anakim, the Zuzums, the Zamzumums, and the Emums, the five races of giants in the Old Testament, none of those races were there because of angels coming down having sex with human women. They weren't. They were there after the vapor canopy collapsed. That's what made them giants because those cultures were older than the flood. Now, over and over, I have shown that in the in the history of the Titans, it was it was understood in ancient Greek history that there was a previous race of humans that were far far larger. They were gigantic. They called them Titans, but the Titans weren't there because angels came down and had sex. With them. None of that. None of that. And, but when the Titans, when the Titan generation was waning, their world was destroyed by by Typhon. Typhon is the fiend, the phoenix. Same thing that caused the Great Flood in 2239 BC. So we have a different culture telling the same story, the Great Flood. When the vapor canopy caused the Great Flood, the vapor canopy fell. Because remember, Atlas was holding up the sky. When Atlas could no longer hold up the sky, the sky fell. So when the sky fell in the Titan of Hesiod and San Cuniathan, in their stories, they, they relate that the Titan race was waning and all their sons and daughters were giants. What happened? How come the Titans couldn't produce Titan sons and giants? I mean, I mean Titan sons and daughters. Now, all their offspring, a whole generation, was the giants. The giants were huge, but they weren't Titanic. And then the giants in the old Greek stories had sons and daughters, but they didn't have giant sons and daughters. They had normal humans for their sons and daughters. So within, within two generations, as the Titans are still alive, they're looking down at their sons and daughters who are gi giants, but their grandchildren were like tiny people. So the grandchildren looked up at the Titans like they were grasshoppers. All within two generations because the vapor canopy fell. When the vapor canopy fell, the ambient radiation was gone from the volcanism. The atmospheric pressure had changed. The vitamin, the vitamin and mineral content of all the flora and fauna was completely altered. The oxygen content was altered, and many of the titans had asphyxiated. They had died. They couldn't. They couldn't. They couldn't function because they couldn't breathe. So. Yeah, none of the stories of the Babylonian stories of gods coming from the sky, having sex with human women, all of that, which the Jews copied when they wrote the book of Genesis, is all BS. That's all the mythological version of history. The Greeks had the, Greeks had the real version of history down pat. Down pat. <clears throat> Hope I didn't entertain too many ta tangents there. I don't think that was the question at all. Oh, Jake Anderson was Egypt in America. <clears throat> in my own research, I show that historians in the 1800s up to 1940 were on board with a great mass migration of Indo-Aryan people who left North America around 34, the 35th century BC. They left. This is the appearance of Enki, the appearance of Enoch in the historical record uh, when the Nemesis X object appeared and the Gihon flood killed one third of the human race. North America was wiped out. 
this isn't just mythological and this isn't just textual and it's just and it's not and nor is it just interpretive by by these people i have gone into detail showing you guys the, the research and telling you about things to look up for yourself look up william cordis's material look up forbidden archaeology by michael kramer and richard thompson look at uh, Barry Fell, America BC, especially go to the website beforeus.com and look at Jonathan Gray's material. And what you're going to find is that on average, 600 feet to a mile underground throughout all of North America was another civilization. And we're pulling up artifacts and we're finding pieces of architecture at that depth everywhere. Everyone knows who's traveled the United States from Texas all the way to California is you're looking at a very recently destroyed world. Anybody driving through all these areas, you can see it, tortured landscapes and all that. It's very, it's very, very clear. Whole ocean basins just emptied out and we're driving through, going to all these towns in New Mexico in these, in these deep wells surrounded by plateaus that are all the exact same level. That's the ancient sea, sea level. That's the ancient sea level. All this was underwater in ancient times. All of New Mexico and Arizona is like that. It's all it's all recent, guys. <clears throat> so uh, I hit my three hour and eight mark. I'm way over. I'm way overdue, guys. There's only one question left on here. No, there's two more questions on here. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and dignify those. Hollis, anything in the historical record about zombies? You mentioned zo zombie fungus in a in a in a recent recent video. Um the only, the only, the only real references to zombies that I know of are in the Jewish records, uh, and there's a, a lot, I don't want to go into a lot. You need to go into the Talmud, the Talmudic texts, where they talk about golems because they talk about building these golems as if it's a fact, and you can create these golems to go out and do services for you, kill people or whatever. Yeah, that's the only thing. That's the only real zombies I know of. <clears throat> Charles Gintz, this is the last one. Jason, during your research of Native Americans, have you have you developed an opinion about skinwalkers? Skinwalkers. I don't know. I've kind of avoided the skinwalker skinwalker ranch controversy because it just seems like a bunch of sensationalism to me. A bunch of dudes just making a bunch a bunch of money filming random stuff and it's in CGI is much crap to me. I don't know. I don't believe they're they're going through all that supernatural phenomenon that they purport, if that's what you're talking about. Uh, skinwalkers, uh, I don't know if it has anything to do with the Sasquatch, the Yeti, the Abominable Snowman, Bigfoot. Uh, I don't I don't know if that's what you're talking about. The Bunyan, uh, I don't know. I don't really know what a skinwalker is. So uh, you'd have to educate me on that. <clears throat> but guys, that sums up this Q&A. I hope I hope it was I hope it was uh, acceptable to you. Thank you guys for your donations. They always help. Believe me, they help. But uh, it's going down because in two days you're gonna get the archaics breakdown of the Matrix. Man, I found some awesome stuff. Found some awesome stuff. I, I, I had so much fun. It's 26 clips of the movie I'll be showing, and uh, I'll be giving you the business about the Matrix. It's uh, it's awesome. We might even do our first round. I told her we're not going to do any raffles till next week. But I, I don't know. We'll see how it goes, guys. We'll see how it goes. But uh, I appreciate your attendance. We'll do another Q&A soon. But we got, some, we got some powerful presentations to unleash. And I got some podcasts I need to, I need to line up. We, I need to get, get a good lineup going. So I'm going to be contacting a bunch of people. Even, even some people on YouTube that are not even expecting me to contact them. I'm, I'm about to reach out to them. Cause I, I've been looking at I've been looking at different channels and, and different personalities and stuff. So we're we're gonna check it out. We're gonna check it out. Till then, till next time. <clears throat>